Evening, y'all. This is Dave with the Georgia Photographer. And today, I've got to make an adjustment with the camera because it's a little bit high. There we go. Uh, today, I'm going to do the live stream from Cosby, Tennessee. Yes, we're up in Cosby, Tennessee. I don't know how echoey it is because I'm in the basement of a cabin we rented and they've remodeled it with like hard surfaces everywhere. So it's probably going to be a little boomy. Let me make a slight adjustment to that level plane. There we go. Anyway, <clears throat> What we want to talk about was some of the things that we found up here and some of the things that we we had fun doing and kind of just talk about what would you do when you go on a little photography vacation and that's what this has kind of become me and Aaron meet up here every year it's the second year we've done it and it allows us to kind of do just guy stuff and and photography related things like we went we went out and we photographed beautiful flowing water flow scenes and we climbed around on the rocks and things like that. And let's see here now. Let's, um, okay. How you doing this evening? I got somebody here. Let me see if I can, what? I don't want to log in. Crap. It's logged me in. It logged me in. I didn't want to be logged in. <laughs> let's see your channel. I'm on it. Ah, oh, there we go. Let's see if I can do it. There it goes. Now let me kill the audio. There it goes. Now let me kill the audio. Yes, I don't want feedback. There we go. Now I've got the live stream playing next to me so I can see the chat. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stick something in chat right quick. There. Now, chat's officially live. Yep. And I'm going to level the camera a little more so y'all ain't bothered by it so much. Now, all right. We've come up here to Gatlinburg. We meet here every year. We, we try to meet on the weekend that the colors peak in the mountains. And so far, we're 0 and 2. <laughs> we come up here every year like the week after some kind of cataclysmic event has knocked all the leaves off the trees. They're, they're still color, but it's not as much color as the peak, you know. And last week, there was that big storm that blew through the south that rained real hard, and the wind blew real hard for like two days, and it blew all the leaves off the trees. So now, you, got, you still have some color, but it's a lot more gray, you know. It's just not as good as it was. <laughs> so that's how it goes so you try to find something else of interest to photograph anyway since you drove all this way and you brought all these cameras you may as well try to find something to take a picture of so we've been out doing that yesterday we went uh we drove a pretty good pace down the road it was about 15 minutes or so to greenbrier we did over 100 miles yesterday oh wow <laughs> well yeah there's more to come to that <laughs> but, yeah now greenbrier is about 15 yeah, we went down to Greenbrier, Aaron's life. He's right out here, literally right there. Yeah, see, <laughs> he's editing. So, <laughs> but we got done at Greenbrier after after we had a interesting incident occur with a very expensive circular polarizer. As you can see, it it's got some very interesting modifications to it now. Yeah, you see all them extra little lines it generates. <laughs> this is a uh, B and W X5 or XS Pro. Uh, Excellent CPL. Yeah, beautiful circular polarizer. Bought the farm yesterday to say to save his lens. It it took a lick so hard that he was running a running a adapter ring step ring to take it down to 77 millimeters so it would fit my five stop fire crest. ND filter. Hit the ND filter behind it so hard that it dismantled it. Piece of the filter ring is still stuck to the adapter. So until I can get home and get that uh, step ring off of the front piece of my five stop ND filter, I can't put it back together. But it didn't break the glass on it. It just popped it apart. So I'm fortunate that I didn't lose my five stop as well as his circular polarizer. I can fix this once I get back home. So we've got this set aside. We've been using variable NDs. We've got one five stop left and some 10 stops. Yeah. 
Ten stops about too much. But <laughs> uh, so after after the after the the D850 deep sixed it into a rock because of the leg on the tripod worked loose, we decided to pack it up and go do something different. So we went and ate lunch. While we was at lunch, we conspired to go find a new circular polarizer. There's no camera shops in Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg, so we expanded the search. We didn't want to drive all the way to Knoxville because we just didn't want to deal with Knoxville. So Aaron did a little bit of digging and found a camera shop in Morristown, Tennessee, the home of the National Weather Service for this part of the country. Always oh, away, LOL. <laughs> all right, Long Rider. I don't have bass angler in here tonight to keep you reined in, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to help me. <laughs> you see what I did, moderator? Yeah, long rider. <laughs> <I'm> on fire. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> bass anglers at a wedding tonight. You know how that works. He's watching someone lose their freedom, as he put it. <laughs> but we found this camera shop, and it was open, and it was in Morristown, which was like a 40-minute drive from Pigeon Forge. So we strike out for Morristown. We thought, we'll ride up there and see what it's about. Um, we get there. It's like the vintage camera store, the best one ever. It's like an amazing camera store in Morristown. There's a, there's a little new stuff there. There, they, the guy running the shop, maybe the owner. I'm not sure if he was the owner. Yeah, he wasn't was, the owner. Because I think the owner is the one that had that personal collection. Well, now, she was, she passed on. They had a uh, memorial to her on that easel. Oh, I didn't see it. That was, yeah, that, that photo that was on the easel just past the big camera display. Gotcha. That was a memorial to her. Huh. Yeah, the lady that owned the camera shop passed on and had an enormous collection of vintage cameras. And they were, they were all in really great shape, of course, because she's collecting cameras, I guess, for that reason. There's a bunch of TLRs and just... just Brownies. Yeah, yeah, just think of a camera. There was one or two of them there. I got some B-roll for the videos that are coming up of it. But um, Aaron asked him, do you, have any, do you have any filters? Well, the guy points to the back, I guess, sends you back there. And it's like pull-out drawers, and they're sorted by size, by, by drawer. He gets down and sits down in the floor because there's like 50 filters in this drawer, and they're all vintage. So we end up with, yeah, I have something made by Canon. <laughs> Aaron got one, and I got the other one. It's a 77-millimeter circular polarizer made by Canon. It's like brand new. It was 25 bucks. Beautiful CPL filter. Gorgeous. So since he got one, I got the other one. And then he was generous enough, since he knows I'm a Nikon guy, he let me have the original, I think this is a Gen 1. Military surplus. Yeah, Mil Surp. Yeah, it was all Mil Surp, all the Nikon gear that we found there. It's a beautiful circular polarizer. Uh, it's not focusing on it. But... It's the wide one, it's the Gen 1. It's got the huge adjusting ring on it, so it's easy to see. But yeah, original Gen 1 circular polarizer by Nikon. Gorgeous filter. I used it today. I used it a little bit yesterday. I never did edit the photos from yesterday evening with it. The ones where I... We've been busy. Yeah, we've been... Either been on the go or messing around with photos or, or sleeping. Then there was this, a, le a legit, early Nikon 50 millimeter f1.4. We did a little test shot with it last night or two. At 1.4, it's a little soft, but at f4, it's like laser beam sharp on the X-T3. Gorgeous little lens, like 65 bucks. <laughs> it's like brand new, beautiful glass. It was filthy when we got it, we cleaned it up. I cleaned up both elements and got it all clean, but beautiful little lens. So I added that one to the collection. Review to come. <laughs> but this is, we, we couldn't believe it. So he got him a circular polarizer and something else, wasn't it? Or did you just get the CPL? Oh, I got the 77 to 67 step down. Yeah, and I got a step down ring too. It's over in the camera bay. We got, he had a, he had a few brand new step rings and a bunch of like old ones in bags. 
But yeah, the lens, he had a whole bunch of old lenses that he was selling. Um, this was like some stuff from a government deal that they had done. Some agency had come into a bunch of Nikon camera gear and they were liquidating the camera gear because the DOD gave it to them. It was, he said it had a really interesting story behind it. And they were selling it on consignment for them. So all this gear had tags on it that had like a guy's name and then the price where that was the government like agent that was representing the sale of this stuff. Yeah, you know, like right here. This one here says B. Berry, $25. <laughs> yeah, it was a ProMaster. It was a brand new one, though, I think. Yeah. Sorry, there's, there's oh, you got the CPL yeah, on it. Yeah, I got the Canon CPL yeah. on it. It's got this one. Now, these ProMaster step rings were new product. He had some new product in the store. He had some Sony camera gear. He was a big Sony guy. He loves shooting Sony. So he had some Sony gear, Long Rider. He likes your stuff, whatever. But. <laughs> Blue News says, OMG, does he have a website? I don't know. Did yeah, he? yeah, yeah. Did yeah. they? Yeah, hold on. It's, what was the no, name no, of it? it? It's uh, oh. castlecamera.com. Yeah, castlecamera.com. It's Castle Camera in Morristown, Tennessee. Full of old camera gear. They had, a, like I said, they had a little new stuff, but he had a whole time, like a display case full of vintage film cameras. They had a bunch of Canon AE-1s. They had a, there's your CPL back. Um, they had a, a advertisement from the mid eighties of the Canon AE one. It showed like four cameras in the photo. They had three of the four cameras hanging on the wall on cup hooks beside the print. It was awesome. <laughs> I got, a, I got video of that. <laughs> he says, Oh, thanks. I use those vintage lenses. <laughs> but yeah, he had, he had four or five big pull out drawers of vintage filters of all kinds, like the colored filters and the, the polarizers, the NDs, and it went from little bitty ones all the way up to the big 82s, I think. Yeah, there were some yeah, 80... There was only one 82 filter. Okay. And it was like a quarter stop. Yeah, you showed yeah. it to me. Yeah. It was like one quarter stop. Like the, CPL, the CPL was more effective as an ND. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It generates more. Castlecamera.com, Long Rider done found it and dropped it into the comments. Oh, I was working on that too. <laughs> Ow. So, yeah. So we left the camera shop and the guy said, you should do some street photography in the town. It's right on Main Street, right in Morristown on the Main Street. Well, Morristown is unique. In the 60s, they came through and built literally a second floor set of sidewalks down both sides of Main Street. Who would have thought? <laughs> Literally poured concrete sidewalks, elevated like 10 or 12 feet off the ground with, po with pillars every so often and made a second story sidewalk system all the way down Main Street. Both sides had crosswalks midway. It was incredible. We got a bunch of photos of it, but it, it's like one of two cities in the nation that did it. Yeah, there's like another one I think was in Maine. Yeah, he said it was in Maine. That, uh, but yeah, they said they was trying to stimulate uh, businesses to move into the, the downtown sector by giving access to the second floor of the Main Street buildings from the street. Instead of having to go in and go up through a staircase inside the building, it allowed access from the road. So it was Just basically- the frontage. Yeah, doubled the frontage by just adding a sidewalk. It was really neat. So we done a bunch of street photography. We met a boy named Travis. Did a, I did a street portrait of him. He was really friendly, told us about some really cool things. We went and looked at it. They had a bunch of those like antique stores and things there. They're real big into that sort of thing in, that, in Morristown. But yeah, let's see here. Those old filters are supposed to be better than the new ones. <laughs> No, it's, my BMW was good. Yeah, that BMW was a pretty sweet filter. I mean, the, this filter isn't, is, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, as you can tell, let's see. There you go. It trashed it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. It took the beating and saved, what, which lens you have it on? I had the Tamron 45 millimeter. Yeah. USB on it. He hit it. Now, Aaron really believes in Tamron lenses, and after seeing his photos, I kind of see why. It 
Good bang for the buck? Yeah, for the price, I can see why people buy them now. I've never actually laid hands on them until I messed with his, and dude, those lenses are phenomenal. The They're all G2s? Oh, are they? They're yeah, all the yeah, newest they're, ones? they're all the newest line, yeah. Yeah, dude, they're, they're fantastic lenses. They're massive, but their vibration reduction, it works. It really it works. works. Like, he was riding down the road today shooting photos of a barn on the side of the road out the window. They're tack sharp. It blew my mind. Yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't even shooting fast. Hold on, let's look no, at No! You were. <laughs> let's look at one of them. Uh, you got the exit data right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the ones going by. And watch it. Yeah, that one was not tack sharp. There's one. Maybe. I don't know. The, no. It's pretty darn sharp. <laughs> You got you got motion blur behind yeah, it, and, one, the, and the barn is sharp. <laughs> it's crazy, guys. Okay, that one that one is it. So we're shooting at ISO 160. Yeah. At 5:30, 5, 5 o'clock at night, the sun's going down behind yeah. the hill. ISO 160, 110 millimeter f point f uh, 5.6 at 140th of a second. Handheld out the window of a truck. The, truck. the truck's driving down the road, <laughs> and these are sharp. It's incredible, guys. Tamron makes a good lens. Lone Rider says, Tamron's half-owned by Sony. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Blue Newt says that the Tamron lenses do really good, too. Yeah, that 7200's yeah. amazing. It's yeah, it, yeah it's, it's phenomenal. It's yeah, really... I, I can see why now that it's given that new Nikkor lens a run for its money. Yeah because it's half the price and you're getting basically maybe 98 percent of the of the nikon lens yeah. for half the money you can have two of them for the same price you can buy the 2040 70. yeah well so what the 2040 70 and the 7200 those are about 13 to 1500 dollars mm -hmm. the best thing to do is kind of like chase the deals and when you got like a deal on b and h grab it so but i mean if you paid full price 1500 bucks you're looking at three grand for Two, for 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 2.8 with yeah. majorable yeah Dude, it's, it blew my mind how good them lenses rendered i mean way sharp really really sharp and that what 15 to 30 is amazing too yeah <laughs> there's there's some there's some good stories about that 15 mil <laughs> we did some really interesting photos with it we got we we got to where we didn't want to go back into national forest so we was like what else can we photograph so i thought hey i want to take pictures of post offices i thought i'm gonna make this coffee table book of post offices you know rural you know americana rural america <laughs> little post offices well we go down to morristown to the post office and i back up across the street i think i had the 55 mil on or maybe the 28 i don't remember i had to go all the way across the street to get it all in frame it's a, and it's like a a 40s or 50s concrete or maybe a marble cut style it says united states post office across the top in, in marble it's real beautiful it's right there on the street and I, I was taking my picture and aaron's telling me hey there's a guy inside waving and i get done with my photo and the guy steps out and he's like hey you can't take pictures of a post office anymore it's like why not it's just a post office he said, it's a federal structure, federal installation or something, and they yeah. don't want us to take that gun pictures of them. I was like, well, crap. He was all, they, all they, they were about very, it. very bothered by the whole situation. Yeah, they were. <laughs> Weapons of mass photography. Weapons of mass photography is what he started calling it after that. <laughs> oh. Blue News says, I'm interested in that 15 to 30. I'll have a few photos. Oh. I, got one, I just posted one up. On what? On Facebook or on, on Flickr or what? Well, it went straight to Flickr and then it went to... Can you put a link on the live stream? Yeah, I'm going to do it right now. Yeah. He's got... He was getting like the whole church. We, we switched to churches. <laughs> so, because like, who's going to tell us we can't take a picture of a church? Come on, you know? <laughs> so, these country churches are plentiful up here. So, we started photographing them rural churches instead. Well, he... He had the whole church in the frame plus the sunset off to the side. Actually, let me post that. I'll post that one to Flickr right now. All right. So let me and, let me do a quick edit on it. All right. And and he was like 20 feet away from the church, and I was like all the way across the yard, up on the street, across the road, next to the barbed wire fence with my 28 millimeter just to get the church in frame. <laughs> it was hilarious. Hmm. 
C2, C2C disciple says that even the generation before the G2 was good lenses. He said, he's got the 15 to 30. You like the 15 to 30? Long Rider says this guy at B&H Photo thinks Tamron makes the Sony zoom lenses. It wouldn't be surprising to me that they farm that out. But Tamron is making Sony zoom lenses now. Are they? Yeah, they're making a whole. They made. They're pushing out a whole lineup for Sony. No, no, no. The Sony lenses that the Sony branded lenses is what he's saying. Yeah, but why would Tamron be making a complete line of making their own brand? Yeah, they're making e mounts for Sony now, Mm -hmm. and still be making cause of contracts. I guess and non disclosure agreements. But Sony makes. I don't know. It's it's a possibility, but. Hey, Grant. Glad to see you check in. Did the Sony arrive yet? If it hasn't, it'll probably be there Monday. I sent it I sent it before I left to come up here. But yeah, I couldn't believe I scored that 50 mil F1.4. All right, that's close enough. This isn't a good edit, but it'll work. Long Rider says that no one can stop you from taking pictures in public of anything in plain view. They sometimes harass you with question, but it's legal. I thought that it was legal as long as you was like on a public street or a public sidewalk that if it was view- viewable from the sidewalk that you could do it. But you know, like it's it's kind of like taboo to photograph like military installations. Like if you're up there taking photos of the Pentagon, they're probably going to have questions, you know. So. It, Maybe certain installations is not the best idea, <laughs> but you know, you go into DC, everybody photographs the White House and the Capitol building and probably the post office. I mean, I would like to have a photo of that post office now that I'm trying to do a coffee table book on it. <laughs> I only need, you know, 160 post offices to have an 80 page coffee table book. <laughs> I ain't gonna give up. I'm gonna keep doing it until someone puts me in jail for it. Because <laughs> like you said, I'm standing on a public street taking a photograph. What? It's a freaking post office for crying out loud. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> All right, the first two photos are uh, with the Tamron. Okay, so. so. I did the picture of the church in the sunset. Yeah. I think that was at 15 mil, somewhere like 15, 16 yeah. mil on the pole frame. And then the black and white, or the pence post I did. Oh, okay. And I think that was 30 mil, but it works really Did you good. post them to the comment? Yeah. The links, the, it ain't showed up on mine yet. It's because you're lagging behind. I sure am. They have a right to question you. You don't have to answer, though. <laughs> Grant says... Carlos Longwriter's moderating me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what it is? I don't what? think I can post a link in Google. That's probably what it is. Here. He posted a link. He's a moderator. Oh, well, po- make a post. Just post something. I can fix this. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> just put something in there and let it come up. All right, watch this. <clears throat> now you got moderator powers. <laughs> That's how quick you can I'm do that. Host tonight. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there's a link. Ah, there you go. Go to that link. You can see the, pi- the pictures I'm talking about. Yeah, first two, yeah, the first two are going to be that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, dude, that 15 millimeter is incredible. I was playing with it the other day and you have to walk like up to like this close to stuff to get it to fill the frame. You have to be right up on it. Cause see yesterday, yesterday's goal was to use this guy all day. I photographed virtually everything I photographed yesterday with the 20 mil F2.8 AFD. This is a beautiful little lens. It takes very good photos. I posted a photo to my Instagram of some Zen rocks on the river where it was right before the photo he, the camera he used to take the picture of me is the, it had this circular polarizer on it right before that image was taken of me. Cause you came back across the rocks and that's when it took the dip. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, this, this lens captured those Zen rocks on my Instagram post. I think I also posted it in the, the Georgia Photographer Gathering, too. But, uh, we pretty much ran primes all day yesterday. Yeah, I ran this one. Yeah. I don't think I changed lenses all day until until we got down there to that bridge. I think the landscape, I put the 7200 on for it and took this off. 
Oh, yeah, that's because we were shooting into those mountains. Yeah, yeah well, we were, the day we, we were trying to do... Aaron, the sunflower shots are gorgeous. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, those, that's a place. Oh, he's looking at your flicker now. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a place. Um, oh, God, what's the name of that farm? It's in Illinois, just on the other side of the Wabash River from Terre Haute, Indiana. And they've got a sunflower maze out there. Oh. And they do like three of them a year because they do the fields in stages. Yeah. So they'll cut a maze in one field when it comes to peak. And then like a month or two later, the next portion of the field to come into peak and they cut another one out. Oh. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> and, and Interesting. Yeah, I loved it. I went out there one evening and shot, but there was a, there was a wedding photographer doing like... Like um, bridal shoots or well, something? Well, it wasn't bridal shoots. It was more like, I don't know, an engagement photo thing. Mm -hmm. And there was only one little section and I was running out of daylight, but I was not trying to step on her toes because oh. she paid money to be out there. Right. You don't so, want to... Yeah. Uh, word to the wise... If you got a pro photographer doing a pro shoot at a public venue like that, typically they paid the venue to have unlimited access. So they can go anywhere in the venue they want to do their, their engagement shoots or their senior portraits or whatever. And try to be courteous. I mean, yeah, you paid to be there too. So technically he could photobomb them, but as a common courtesy, stay out of their frame. It's just good etiquette. Yeah, it's just good. It's just being nice, you know? <clears throat> the rivers and bridge shots are wall hangers. <laughs> Man, y'all gonna make his head swell up so much he ain't gonna be able to go up the staircase in a little while. Y'all gonna have to lay, lay off a little bit. I appreciate the compliments, guys. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Look at Blue New. Darn the field with the wide open sky. <laughs> yeah, it's just a wall thing. <laughs> yeah, we had a good time today. Oh, yeah. Pit, public service announcement. It, when you pack your chargers to charge your Nikon D810 batteries, all right, for your trip of your fall color photo trip, be sure to pick the one that charges Nikon batteries and not the one that charges the Sony video camera batteries because this one won't charge a D810 battery. Unfortunately, the D850 chargers that Aaron brought will charge my batteries. <laughs> so, <laughs> They're made by Nikon. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's not a Z6 battery. They're different. Yeah, okay. okay. You know, that, so the Z, no, no, the Z6, is it? I don't, isn't the Z6 a new battery, guys? I think no, it is. No, it's the Z50 that's got the new battery. Oh, I thought the Z6 had a new one, too. Uh -huh. Is it used a D850 battery? That uh -huh. would be I sweet thought, if I it did. they all used the DV15, is that it? The but yeah, I brought the wrong battery charger for the D810. I have no way of of charging the batteries in it myself. <laughs> you brought a Sony battery, didn't you? Charger. Yeah, I bought the one to charge my my I'm Sony sorry. video batteries. So yeah, I thought the Z6 was uh, no the no 15. Blue Newt said he just got the Z6. It uses the same battery. Yeah, the EL15. Right okay, yeah, you EL15. Said it's a 50. Yeah, so the Z50 uses a unique battery. Yeah, the Z50 is the next iteration of what the Nikon 1 batteries are. Yeah, so, the little tiny lipos or whatever. Yeah, they're, they're tiny. They're like yeah. 1,000 mAh maybe. But yeah, I couldn't believe this. I got my charger. Because I, I ran live view a lot yesterday. And when you run live view on a D810, it drinks the batteries pretty regular. And I've got two in the camera. I run the, the I have a Vivitar brand battery grip on my D810. Let me... Let me grab it, it's right here. And this battery grip works really well. Here, I'm back in frame. Ah, there we go. But, it, and it works really well. See, that's what I've been running for the last couple of days, but it was running the 28 mil, but like I said, we was doing some skyline kind of trying to get some colors in the sky and it was sunsetting. It was a, be a beautiful vista of a mountain range across a lake. Oh, I can and actually post one of those on Instagram. Yeah, he's gonna. Rare I meant to flicker. But the the Vivitar grip, the, I don't know if the Nit Nikon grip, but the Vivitar on tray only holds one battery. So I'm not sure if the actual Nikon grip does too or not, but I have the AA tray as well. I always carry it as a backup. So I would have had batteries had it gotten down to it. But I did have two charged batteries in my bag, so that's these. I wasn't completely out of the game yet. It would have just been really expensive buying double A's a bunch of Duracells later. But yeah, 
this old workhorse is still trucking along. The rubbers fell off the battery door. <laughs> it's starting to come off of the grip area too, I think. Back here, yeah. The rubber buckles off of them. I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but see how it's coming off? It's like the glue gives up over time. Rubber baby bunker? Yeah, that, that glue dies and it starts to peel off. I think it gets the skin oils under it and the skin oils acidic and it, and it breaks down the adhesive of the rubber. And it just falls off. I tried to fix it on the battery, but it swells the rubber and it won't go back on. So I just took it off. I mean, it didn't hurt the camera. It does open up if that was sealed because there's two ports where the little, there was little studs on the back of the, of the rubber cover that went in them holes. And now there's actual openings there, but I don't get, I don't submerge the camera. So it's not an issue. Yeah, I can't, I can't let go of this. <laughs> But yeah, that Vivitar grip works, and it wasn't very expensive. If you've never used a Vivitar battery grip, the DF uses a different charger, yeah. Grant says, what do you think about the A7 II? Actually, he's, he's salting the conversation because I just shipped him my A7 II, the one that I've had for so long. He, he was wanting to get one, and I, I was wanting to unload one. And I needed someone to take that, that box full of problems. I mean, that beautiful camera. <laughs> but it, it has, it's given me trouble with the Ibis in the past. And I fully disclosed that to Grant. He knows all about it. And I even sent it pro bono. I was like, once you get it and the camera actually works, then send me some money. You know, if it gets down there and he can't get it to work, then I don't want him to have, feel compelled to pay me for it. It's like, just just tape the box back shut and mail it back and I'll do something with it, you know. But anyway, he wants to talk about the A7 II. I really like my A7 II. I really enjoyed shooting with it. I, I hated the menus. I'll just be honest with you, the menus drove me nuts. I really don't like Sony menus, just to be honest with you. It's just the Nikon menu architecture. Yeah, if I can get it to come on. That menu architecture, huh, it's overexposing it because it's, yeah, you can't tell. <laughs> it hasn't changed in like 30 years, I guess. Ever since they've had digital cameras, it's been the same menu architecture. And it's, it's just one long sequence or list and you got sections or section headings of that list. So you can just scroll through it and it's kind of logical. It makes, once you learn it, it makes sense. The menu has, the Sony has tabs, that have sub menus, which have sub tabs, and you gotta know which sub tab in each sub menu that you need to get into to do certain things, and they sometimes don't seem like they're logically placed. Some of the stuff I needed access to was way deep in a side menu, and it seemed, in my mind, it should have been like a main first menu kind of item. You just have to, you have to learn it. I get that, but. I messed with that camera for several months and never got used to the menu system. I just couldn't. But the cameras too take beautiful photos. The video button on the original A7 II is very small. It's hard to press. It's in the corner. I didn't like that button. So I was filming with it for a while. I used it to make videos for a good while. And it, uh, that video button was really hard to work with. I didn't like that. It don't have a fully articulated screen. It, it articulates more than this one. This one don't articulate at all. But, <laughs> but as far as like adapting lenses, it having it being mirrorless, you can. I, that's where I got started doing adapted lenses, and I really liked adapting lenses to the A7 II. It's a lot of fun to use, and it being full frame, you know, you stick this lens on it. It's a 70 to 200, and I shot this lens on that A7 II. This one. I have the adapter rings that has the aperture control, so you can actually control the aperture in the lens. Even they're not very expensive, so I use them. It worked really well, but it was just uh, it basically wasn't as fun for me to use as my XT3 is, so I just never used it. Sierra would get it out and do portraits of herself or she would do some little photo project with a cat or something with it. But I've showed her how to use the X-T3 so she, has, she still has access to a camera. She likes to use the live view. You know, she's learned how to do photography on a smartphone. So she's look, used to looking at a picture of a 
Oh, well. So that's the way it goes, but oh, Grant's done got the dummy adapter for the nickel or glass. I have like three of them, dude. You should have said something. I'd have thrown them in a box for a small nominal fee. I don't know why we didn't think to ask about that. <laughs> I still, I think I have three or four Sony to various, I think they're Minolta bayonet mounts. MD mounts, is that a thing? Yeah, Minolta has a bayonet too, just like everybody else. I've got some of them. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why we didn't think of that. But yeah, they, they're stacked up in the cabinet along with all the other adapters I bought. <laughs> That's kind of funny. But yeah. Uh, and finally got this thing installed on the camera. The, uh, what's, who's this? Uh, Peak Design, the hand grip deal. Oh, the clutch. Yeah, the, got this based on Aaron. And I really like that. You don't drop your camera. Yeah, <laughs> it's really handy. It's good for big stuff. Yeah, nice. it works really good. Plus it has an Arca Swiss plate built into the mount for the bottom section. So that allows you to just stick it straight on the tripod. I try not to tripod mount this body with this lens because this lens has got a lot of lever weight. So I'll stick an Arca Swiss plate on this. Now, uh, uh, you know, that's the tripod foot mount. <laughs> you did it. Into the Eastern Tennessee sunset. <laughs> I figured out how that you did it. He's got, he's got a preset from Lightroom that he's going to sell. They're only like, it's only like a $20 preset. It's called Nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was this guy I was running through like this Eastern, while we were researching for places to go. Mm -hmm. There was that Eastern Tennessee. Um, what was it? Nature photographer or something? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. A Facebook group and this guy kept posting these like nuclear sunsets. Yeah, they're like super saturated. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I figured out he did. He just dehazed it a hundred percent. Nuclear. Nuclear sunset. Nuclear sunset. All right, I really need to upgrade to this. Oh. Yeah, look at that little number. Uh, it says D850 on it. This It does stuff like that hinges out. That's something the D810 doesn't do. These buttons light up. I don't know if you can tell it or not, but them buttons are lit up. That's, that's a really nice feature. And this is that wonderful 15 millimeter lens. Look at this monster. <laughs> that's like I mean this is a 77 millimeter um, circular polarizer <laughs> it's enormous you know what I don't even think you can put a 100 millimeter filter over the thing I don't know I yeah it, it's it, huge I think it would have to take a yeah, 15 to 30. No, I think it would have to take 150 <laughs> by 150 So this is 100 by 100 millimeter. Yeah, 100 millimeter plate. Uh, no, it'll be yet. It's going to see outside the filter because it sees way out here. Yeah. It, yeah, you can't you can't plate it with a 100 millimeter plate filter. It won't work. It's too big. <laughs> yeah, this thing is a literal landscape machine. Yeah. Or, or indoor photography. Yeah, we figured that out too. It does awesome portraiture. What I was originally bought it for was to start doing like uh, uh, photography inside of houses for real estate. Yeah. You know, for <laughs> realtors. Go in and start, yeah, actually making a little bit more money. Grant says, never had that problem. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He also brought his D500 just in case he wanted to shoot crop sensor since he knew I was bringing the X-T3, I guess. I've run the X-T3 with the 28 millimeter F2.8 um, Nikkor lens and I've run it with that 55 millimeter. And we were literally, we hiked up to a waterfall today. We wanted to go up to, the, to this waterfall, or I really did. I don't think Aaron was really stoked about it until I nudged him and nudged him and nudged him. And he finally said, all right, let's go. <laughs> it was two miles up a mountain, literally, all the way to the waterfall. It was, except the last 10th of a mile, it was 2.1 miles to the waterfall. 
We walked two miles and the last sign before you get to it is 0.1 miles. It's a uh, Hen Wallow Falls. Yeah, Hen, Hen Wallow Falls. And it's pointing down this slope and it's like this steep escarpment. 30 degrees? Yeah, degree. it's like 30% grade for that it's last like, tenth of a mile. It's like coming into Chattanooga. That's southbound on 165. You know, you just... Yeah, this is like straight down to this waterfall. And it's a cat. It's a 90-foot cascade over a bunch of rock slopes. Beautiful little stream. Didn't have as much water as I was kind of thinking it was going to have because we had a lot of rain Wednesday night into Thursday. And all day Thursday, it rained up here. All day. So there was a lot of water. So we was expecting it to be flowing a little stronger than it was. But I still got some nice long exposures of it. But yeah, we get up there to it. And um, the, there was two Japanese couples showed up a few minutes later. And I, was, I took a couple of exposures of it with just landscape style. And then that couple wanted to do pictures in it. And I, I, I thought, man, this would look so much cooler if I could do a long exposure with a person in it. Hey, Max, how you doing? Glad to see you dropping in. And... So I asked the lady if she would sit down on this log right in front of the bottom portion of the waterfall and she could sit perfectly still for a few seconds while I did a long exposure because I wanted the water to have that nice, smooth, silky look to it of the long exposure, but a person in the frame. Now, they didn't have any way of hitting her with flash or anything, so I couldn't do it that way, so I had to just have her sit still. She sat very well for me. She sat through two six-second exposures to let me get the picture I wanted. <laughs> then, um, oh, and, I, and I noticed I got to crop it a little bit because her husband was standing just barely in frame on the side. He, you can see just like part of his shoulder and his arm when I done the edit. But then I got her and him on a two and a half second exposure while their friend was taking their picture with a smartphone because while he was doing his pinch zoom and stuff, I just sped up the or reduced the ND just a touch more and fired me off a two and a half second exposure while they waited on that one and got a really good one of that. They're not looking at me, they're looking at him, but it's still a pretty cool photo because it's got these two hikers at the they're base of the fall. They're looking at that guy doing the smartphone photo. Oh. Yeah. You know, their friend was taking smartphone photos of them. But yeah, so then when you leave Hen Wallow Falls. You go uphill 30% grade for a tenth of a mile, which means you're winded really bad. Then it's two miles down about a three, four, five percent slope all the way back to the paved road. So it's nice on the exit because the payoff is it's this nice gentle downhill. So you're not like really working super hard. It's just a, a nice easy walk back to the pavement. And if you catch it, I'm, I'm assuming if you went up there, you know, if it had more rain, the wall, the falls would be a little more energetic. If it had a helicopter, it would drop you there. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have a couple of, a couple of enduro motorcycles. <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to do an enduro up there. It'd be like a hill climb. Yeah. <laughs> you wind up going backwards. <laughs> well, we, we kicked around the idea of donkeys. <laughs> Pack animals. <laughs> We was hiking in. I got video footage of the um, Grant says, so where are you off to next? So we left there. Okay. Maxim says, sounds like a fun trip. Oh, we done been to Morristown, Tennessee to the camera store. We done bought circular polarizers, collectible ones. This is like a first gen Nikkor one. Look at this thing. It's like brand new. It's beautiful Nikon circular polarizer. It's, it's, it's perfectly new. It's nearly new. It was filthy. We had to clean it good, but beautiful knock on. Um, and then I got a Canon one that is just like his. And it's a slim line. It's a PL-C2. These work really well. They actually work better than the knock on one. The knock on one doesn't generate as much differential as the, the Canon one does. But they say the Gen 2 Nikon, which is also a low profile, is a much better circular polarizer. But I just wanted it because it was cool. That's a piece of Nikon equipment I never had. Oh yeah. That up. That's with the 70 to 200. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. The, he's putting up, um, 
He's putting up these photos of, of the places we went to yesterday. We just stopped on this boat ramp. There was a lake and the water was down. What did we decide? 25 about, feet, 20 at feet? At least 25 feet down, whatever that lake was, just south of Morristown. Uh, on, the way, on the way back to Cosby. Um, yeah, we'll look up the name it's of the lake. It's a big lake. lake. I've been on, all over that lake shooting for... Is that that lake? Yeah, it's Douglas Lake. Douglas okay, Lake. So, wow, so, it's enormous. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it winds and winds and winds and winds and winds. Man, but it was way down. Where, where did we come? We, I think we came in we were on the 32 point. Yeah, somewhere there. I think that's there. where we were. And there's a boat ramp. We pull down on the boat ramp, and he takes a look at these mountains across the lake, and he's like... I want to set up a I want to set up a tripod and get a and get a landscape shot of that. So, you got the link to it? Yeah, it's on it's on the. Oh, he put it on his Flickr uh, page that he put the link here, to earlier. Here, I'll, I'll do this again. What? What? There, it's posted. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on. Okay, never had that problem. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, he posted a new link so you can see that photo. Yeah, it was it was incredible. But yeah, I was kind of happy to score my little 50 millimeter F1.4. He had the older, was it like, what's the one before this? The one has got the machined and focus rock knob. It doesn't have the rubber grip on it. I can't remember that model series. It's like Q lenses, Nikkor Q. E series? Yeah. It, it's not an E series. No. It predates E series. Yeah. It was a, but it was a beautiful lens. It had a lot of, of usage wear, but he wanted a lot of money for it. I just couldn't see giving that for it. It had, they had some play in the aperture ring. I was kind of starting to worry about how, how well it was going to work. This one's so old it won't fit my D810. It does. It needs the. The modified, it, it has never been updated with the AIS aperture ring, so it won't go on the D810. We tried to put it on, it wouldn't fit, but it will fit the X-T3. And with the test shots we've done handheld at F4, it was laser sharp. Awesome pick, Aaron. Do you bring up the shadows at all? Just curious. <laughs> yeah, I was just telling him it was just a quick edit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was just there for like, hey, this is what we were taking a picture of. Yeah. This is not something to be printed. <laughs> he said, I got the 55 millimeter F1.2. Has that knobby ring. Love it. Wow. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Maxim says, get the Nikon DF. And that non-AI lens will work like a champ. Will it really? That DF is the one that's the... That's the one that looks like the old... Uh, looks like an X-T3. Nah, well, it, it looks, looks like, like a film camera. It looks like one of the... Uh, was it the, It's a retro style. Uh, FM models? Yeah. Yeah. FM. yeah, it's like a retro... Uh, yeah. Ain't those... Are those full frame? Mm -hmm. yeah, they are? I think so. Hold on, let me find out. I don't... Use those with the DF. That's what Blue Newt just said, too. I'm going to use it with the X-T3. That's my intention. Yeah, it's a 16.2 megapixel full frame. Yeah. Richard Biden, you guys are cool. What's he saying? Do more pictures and less technical. <laughs> yeah, with the live stream, it's a lot harder for me to do that. <laughs> Next time you do one. Yeah. When you're not like camping. Maxim's yeah. tried to talk me into doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, I'll get him set up with OBS so he can, like, you know, drag a picture in there and take, you know, do a little talking head thing. Yeah. So. Baby yeah. steps, man. Baby steps. Yeah, I got to get there. <laughs> you're talking to a machinist. All right. We need to cut something out of metal. I'm your guy. But when it comes to the technology, I knew it 30 years ago, but now this is, it's, yeah, it's not as easy for me anymore for some reason. <laughs> for me to for me to be able to do the live stream at all is like a huge step up, you know. <laughs> oh look. <laughs> did you share the live stream on your Facebook page? I did. <laughs> I did indeed. Uh, like probably four yeah. people that, you know, visit my Facebook page. Yeah. There you go. All three of them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All right, I gotta shed the coat. It's getting too hot. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking the Lookout Mountain Pizza Company shirt today. Yes. <laughs> oh, look, Grant's got a good question. Here's a question to stir the pot. Crop versus full frame. Oh, he went there. <laughs> I have both. I can't, I can't join this argument. <laughs> well, now here, here, I can put it. Okay, so cameras are like tools. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to use a three quarter wrench when you need a twelve millimeter wrench. Oh, so ah. that's, that's, that's why I carry D eight fifty and a D five hundred. Like mm -hmm. if I'm one of these sports, like you know, uh -huh. sports or wildlife, I bust out the D five hundred and I pop a big lens on it. Yeah, doing really slow stuff for portraitures, I get the D eight fifty. Yeah. So yeah, it just depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> I, I will say, if you're trying to save weight, crop sensor. Yeah. 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 I mean, size and weight. If yeah. you want a smaller camera, get a crop sensor camera. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. And I, I can't advise Olympus for anything. <laughs> you know, I've tried. I've seen some beautiful photos come out of Lumix cameras. Yeah. I mean, they're Micro Four Thirds. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything bad about Micro Four Thirds. Just, <laughs> see, to see disciples agrees with you. Yeah, I don't. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I done a, like a bunch of Olympus shoots and I, I every time I get a hold of their their raw files and you know I start processing them like yeah no yeah no <laughs> yeah no <coughs> that's a good one <laughs> oh lord <laughs> but yeah I mean I use um I use my XT3 for like general photography and like snapshot sort of stuff, maybe street sort of things mainly. And like all of the landscape stuff I shot, I've got my D810 out and used it. Uh, I did use the D810 all day yesterday. Yeah. I, I think I got the, the um, XT3 out once and used it for one little thing and then put it up. When, and, weren't you shooting the XT3 down in uh, Morsell? Uh-uh. I took the D the D810 with the 20 mil. I thought you were using the XT3. Mm -mm. I yeah. used the D810 on all of that, oh. and uh, yeah, ran the 20 millimeter. Remember, because I, I took his portrait and I told that uh, we met a boy named Travis in Morristown, and real friendly guy, real chatty. And I asked him, I said, "Can I make your portrait?" And he's like, "Sure." He was all about it. So I got him to stand next to a sign, like a tuxedo rental place, and I just had him stand by that sign. And I told him, I said, now this is a 20 millimeter. I said, so what that means is I'm gonna get what seems to be uncomfortably close to fill the frame. I'll show you what I mean when I'm done. And so I made his portrait and he's like, you got that close? He said, and I showed him the picture and he said, wow, it looked like you were so much closer. But I was just trying to teach myself to use the 20 millimeter, it was this one. This little 20 mil F2.8, it's a gorgeous little lens. If you ever get a chance to, to just shoot wide angle, there's, you know, there's wider lenses, yeah. But this thing is, it's, it's an incredible little lens. It does a beautiful job. And it's reasonable filter thread size. It's 62 millimeter filter thread. So you can actually put reasonably sized filters. I run a step up ring and go up to 77 or 60, uh, what was it 67 mil and get a little bit bigger to kind of reduce vignetting issues. So you're looking through a bigger filter, but but yeah, I really like this little lens. It works really well. It is a AFD, so it does have screwdriver focus. So you know, if you don't have a a camera with a screwdriver focus motor in it, you're gonna have to manually focus it. But it works. It works really well. I like this lens. I don't use it that much though. I find myself using other lenses more so that's why i was kind of part of the game this time was to use this like for a whole day and i did it'll it'll teach you to think outside the box of your usual lenses that you pick you know you know because people get stuck on certain focal lengths like for me i like the 55 to 58 mil on a, on a crop sensor camera and 35 to 70, I like that 35 to 70 nick or zoom on the full frame. So, you know, I'm running about, I'm running, I like apparently about 85 millimeter focal length is what I 
come to determine is my sweet spot that I enjoy using. So for me to use a 20 millimeter, that's way outside my comfort zone. <laughs> yep, I both, yep, what Aaron said. <laughs> uh, that one's been on my list for a long time. I found this one on eBay. That's where I bought it. I bought it, now I've had it for probably three years. Um, I don't remember exactly when we went out west, but I bought it because we went out west on a tour and I wanted to be able to do landscapes with it. And uh, I used it a good bit on that tour and then it's rode around in the camera bag and then it wound up in the cabinet. And <laughs> it's been sitting in the cabinet collecting dust for probably a year. I'd, just, I'd move it out of the way here and there to get a different lens out. I've got a whole bunch of lenses stacked up in a cabinet where I do all those lens reviews on these older lenses. I save all of them. But, yeah, that's there. They're more expensive now. I don't remember what I paid for this one. It was it was a good bit of money. Ten years ago, I'd assist on a wide prime, insist on a wide prime. These days, a 16 to 35 F4 is all I need. Yeah, yeah, this, um, if you're shooting in some dim situations, yeah, the extra stop a light helps, but it does make the background, you get just a little bit of background bokeh with this lens at f2.8. It does give you a little, but not much. You know, the depth of field is still pretty deep, even at even at f2.8. But it does give you that that stop of light if you do if you worry on the things like that. You know, some people say there's a new somebody was sharing it. There's a new school of thought, or not really a new one, but it's coming back around about how the camera sensor captures the data no matter what the image is presented to you on the, on the back of the camera looks like. The same data is saved by the sensor and you can change it all in Lightroom. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Maxim doesn't give a flying squirt about Boca. <laughs> I mean, some people like it. And I like it in certain scenarios. In a in a uh, in a headshot portrait, it's kind of nice to me because it, it gives you the subject isolation. But it's only because I don't want the background to kind of take away. If I'm you know, because I'll typically end up shooting outside. I don't have access to a. You can do that and just do a whole picture. Of <laughs> I remember that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a he's got a picture and it's a square frame and there's like a it's like white on half and blue on half and it's like two bokeh balls and they're nearly stacked on top of each other and that's that was all it is. Kids Coast last year. Is that where you did that? Yeah, that was when it, <laughs> that was like a truck when we were getting out to go walk around. Oh, <laughs> and I, I was shot at like it was a bumper or something and it was like a little bokeh blare coming. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, it's a picture of just bokeh. Maxim says, only photographers care. <laughs> People who look at the pictures could care less. And I know you're, I know you're exactly right. Sad reality is you're right. Um, we were talking about that the other day, about um, someone brought up the subject of Instagram photos and they looked at the photo and they were bragging on the model. And someone said, man, that must be a great photographer. And the person said, no, I don't give a crap about who the photographer was. That doesn't matter. It, look how beautiful the model is. It's like, yeah, but the photographer is the reason the photo of the model exists. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it's a, it, it's a, what's that word? Um, it's not combined, no. Um, when you have, when you have two organisms that, that, the the sum is greater than the the you know the 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 what is it the product is greater than the sum of its parts you know <laughs> it's one of those deals symbiotic it's kind of symbiotic you know without the model you don't get the picture and without the photographer the model is just standing there so you know <laughs> it's kind of it's a double it's a double two way street you know but no one notices the photographer's work it's kind of strange Maxim's right they don't care. We care because we want it to look pretty, but they don't care. And it surprises me how many people will take snapshots and they'll just be atrocious. And they'll look at that snapshot on their phone and they'll think it looks so good. 
Yeah, my wife does it. I hate to say it about her, but she'll do it. She'll do selfies for this or that, and she'll be backlit, so it's a black silhouette in front of an illuminated window because the phone's trying to figure out the exposure. She's happy. I'm like, oh, I don't see how. It just bugs me to death. <laughs> oh, look, Grant's done, Grant's done poking at Max basically here. He says, it might be fun to do a bokeh challenge. <laughs> I think I think if Aaron joins in on that, he's already won with that picture he's got. Oh, the Boca ball? It's just one Boca ball right in the middle of the frame, and it's a square prop, and it's one dot. Oh, it's my Pokemon Boca. Yeah, it looks like a Pokemon. It does. Well, yeah, we can do that. Photography challenge, Boca. Yeah. I gotta build the video. A serious one. It has to be a very unserious. Challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. It has to be comedic. You have to have fun. It doesn't. Yeah, you don't need to stress over this one if we do it. Um, and I've got the the submissions for the negative space challenge. They're in my inbox. I haven't built the video yet because I was getting work out of the way last week and getting ready for this trip, so I didn't have time to actually make the video. That's why there was no upload Wednesday. I just didn't have time. And that's why there was no upload today. And I'm doing a live stream because I can live stream in real time, but I didn't have time to do a video edit because I was out doing photos all day for two days. So now I can only be in so many places at once. But next week I have probably 350 video clips that I've done over the past couple of days of stuff that I'm gonna make videos out of this with. And whoever was asking me, you know, more photos, less technical, the videos are coming. I got the footage and I've got stuff that I've, I've shot a bunch of footage at home that I ain't used yet. And I've got footage here and I've got a lot of footage. So there's more to come. And I've got a bunch of photos from it that I'm gonna share as well. I'm gonna bug my eye or something. Let's see, collaboration. That's the right word. Thanks, Long Rider. Collaboration is the word. But yeah, that that camera shop, dude, it just blew my mind. It's like the, place, the whole town. Yeah, yeah. The, the general whole... store was like awesome. Did you tell them about the general store? No, no. It's like a museum. You go up in there. Yeah, it's like going back in time. It was bizarre, and the people were super friendly. They probably spent thirty minutes talking to us. Yeah. Let us take all the pictures in the store we wanted. Had no problem with it. It was interesting just to be there. Everybody we talked to or bumped into was super friendly. It's Eastern Tennessee, that's the way it is here. <laughs> Everybody's nice here. Hey, look here. Well. <laughs> oh no, the beard will take over the camera. Oh yeah, it's still working. It ain't yeah. quit yet. <laughs> time on break. <laughs> Everybody, this is, um, his his uh, flicker and all that is Aaron's life. If you want to find him, he's on, he's on Facebook too. Oh yeah. yeah, it's under Aaron Life. Yeah, and if you, and you're in the you're in the Georgia Photographer Gathering. Yes, I yeah. Am so in he's in there. If you haven't joined yet, go join. Um, the gathering is there for everybody to share information and photos and you know talk trash about cameras and you know Maxim doesn't like to do that. Everybody just remember that he's not interested in the trashing camera brands, but. <laughs> I expect there to be a fairly heated comment from Max any minute now about that. <laughs> but we've just been literally riding around thinking of stuff. We, we got on the internet this morning. Don't get me started, he said. <laughs> I'm poking the bear. <laughs> What a waste of time, he said. <laughs> well, this has been a pretty heavy Fuji Nikon weekend. You know, today I shot with the Fuji a lot because I use it for just run and gun. I really, you it's know. the more up problem. The what? More up problem. More up. Yeah, more up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. As we went to that waterfall, every time we'd round a curve, well, I looked at the, the you know, they give you a little graph that shows the altitude as you get to the, 
to the goal. Well, it shows it dipping a couple of times, and then it, you can see where it went down to the waterfall. And so every time we'd round a corner, there'd be a little level stretch on, along the brow of the ridge or whatever. I tell him, so we must be getting close. We're, it's leveling off. He'd get around the corner, and he's like, nope, more up. <laughs> Of the day was more up. <laughs> yeah. Look, Maxim's like, look, what a waste of time. Not laughing. <laughs> He's not. He, this isn't funny to him. What? This? Is no, funny. the whole bashing camera brands. The guys in the group, there's a private group that of guys that oh. like to go at each other that one of them's a Sony shooter, one of them's a Canon shooter, and one of them's a Nikon shooter, and they constantly are going like back and forth. It's like the Ford versus Chevy thing for the people that don't know what we're talking about. And Max has gotten kind of vicariously drug into this so that he has to read this mess, and it's, it gets on his nerves, okay? You know, this is just something that doesn't interest him. And he's wading through this mire, and he doesn't like it. And I can agree with it to some extent, you know. So we're sitting here laughing about it, but this isn't a laughing thing to him. He's tired of hearing about it. That's what that's what you're seeing these comments about. He says, as he says, you're a good way to lose friends for no reason. That's what he means. You know, you're it, if you bash camera brands, a person might be invested in a camera that they just like the way it feels in their hand. And they don't care. It's a tool. Yeah, it's it's a tool to it's get tool. to achieve a means to an end. And at the end of the day, he's right. The camera isn't the important part. It's the loose nut behind it that matters. You know, doesn't matter what you use to capture the image as long as you're out there capturing the image. That's what matters. It, it could be your smartphone. It could, you know, a GoPro. Seriously. I mean, I've seen people doing photos on their family vacation with their GoPro. Mm -hmm. At least they're doing it, you know? So, yeah, I tend to agree with that. Well, I mean, think of where technology was, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago with cameras. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 15 years ago, a D200 was still a pretty cutting edge camera. And now you can literally buy them for 50 bucks on eBay. Mm -hmm. And it takes beautiful photos. I use, uh, I have a D200 with the 18 to 200 millimeter um, DX lens, the zoom lens from Nikon. And my daughter uses it to great effect. When we go out and shoot together, she loves that camera. She loves the fact that the 18 to 200 allows her to have a whole bag of lenses in one. And she, she doesn't care about F-stops. She wants to get the photo. <laughs> she loves that camera system. And it takes beautiful photos. They're 10.3 megapixels, a little over 10 megapixels is what the sensor is in the D200. But it works really well. And it's cheap. You can, you know, and if you get one and the batteries are crap, get on Amazon and buy a couple of batteries. They're about 20 bucks. You know, and you've got brand new batteries. You know, they're not expensive. They're just not expensive. So Hassan T says, now that the Z50 is out, what do you expect from the Z70? Ooh, there's a Z70? Now you done got me interested. Uh, I don't know. That's kind of got me wondering. Because honestly... If they do a Z70, that means the Z50 is officially the mirrorless replacement for the 5000 series. Mm -hmm. And if they do a 70, that would be their replacement for the 7000 series. Yeah. And I would be interested in that as my small carry around camera. I wouldn't mind going to a camera shop and handling one before I bought it rather than just buying it from Amazon and sending it back. But rumor is that it's coming out in 2020. Interesting. It probably is. I Now, I said this not long ago. I think Nikon's moving completely towards the Z mount with the S line lenses and they want to slowly but surely phase the DSLR completely out because manufacturing cost on a DSLR is significantly higher than on a mirrorless camera. That whole mirror box assembly plus the pentaprism mechanism is very costly to manufacture and none of it exists in the Z series cameras at all. It's just a little LED display and that's so much simpler for them to manufacture. So they could, if they could, they'd quit making DSLRs tomorrow and make it, and tell everybody that's buying the D850s to buy the Z7s instead. If they could have it their way, that's the way it would go because it's... Z7 
57 doesn't have that same tactile functionality that the 850 does. I mean, yeah, maybe similar sensors, uh, you know, megapixel wise, but it it's not an 850. Yeah, you know, I don't right. care how many lenses you adapt to it or how many megapixels, it's not an 850 in your hand. So you, until they get something similar to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> kind of the point of the mirrorless also is the lower, the the smaller chassis. You know, you you get that thinner that thinner flange distance allows you to make it a little slenderer, so it's not quite as bulky. I'm not talking about the but the, the size grip, of it. But the grip needs to have the buttons. Yeah. You know, even the menus are, are you, you're the functionality of what you can do with your fingers and the menu is. A lot less, I believe, than what you can with the 850. Yeah, that I mean, the 850 is covered in buttons on the outside, which yeah. is a wonderful thing because the more buttons on the outside of the camera, the less stuff you have to menu dive to get to. That's one of the beauties of the 800 series cameras is they're large bodies, so they have plenty of real estate to put a lot of buttons on them. And when you can do that, you can. Now you can't remap them all. That's kind of a down. I wish you could remap several of the buttons on my D810 because I would remap them to do different things. I was able to remap a couple of them. Like my video record button is now my ISO button and has been for a couple of years. And I noticed on his D850, they put an ISO button right next to the video record button because that's where I was wanting to mash with the ISO button anyway. No, that's pretty sweet. But now Max, Max is saying that he's got a four megapixel DSLR, he says, but it, if you go over eight by 12, that the resolution falls apart. And, and I agree with that because I've looked at like iPhone photos printed in eight by 10, they look good. But when you print them like um, 11 by 14, they fall apart and they're 12 megapixel. So I agree with you there, but you also showed me yourself that if you wanted a larger image, you could just stitch them together. If you didn't have access to that, was it you got a you've got the Canon 6D that you did that 200 megapixel stitch with that day, <clears throat> you could easily stitch six or seven of these together and get you a 20 by 30 print. If you wanted, if you didn't have access to a higher megapixel camera, you could take that camera and generate an image quality enough that you could get to the to a 20 by 30 print with it, it would just take more work. Correct? I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking that that's what you were showing that day on that live stream. It's the same thing as doing like a gigapixel. Yeah, MSGA. that's, yeah, that's just, what he was doing. He was showing you, you don't need the 100 megapixel GFX 100 to get a large image. I need the GFX 100. <laughs> no, you just stitch them. Hockey. <laughs> I need a GFX 100. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, if I was ever, it, it, you know, I keep saying, like, if, if I was to outgrow the D850 mm -hmm. for landscapes, I would have, you know, the next logical step would be the GFX 100. Yeah. You know, but that would just be for landscapes. Yeah. Yeah, see, yeah, he, he says a six photo stitch with four megs each will give you a 14 megapixel without a crop. Right. And you could print that. Probably you couldn't go twenty by thirty. You'd well, have to do a bunch more images to get twenty could, by thirty. You could also you could also do an ex exposure bracket. So if you did four image, mm -hmm. four images times you know three exposures, so that would give you what 12, 12, yeah. so 12 times four on top of that. Yeah, you know, I see what you're doing. Megapixel. Yeah, and then you you not only not only could you stitch it together, but you're also increase that dynamic range. Yeah, increasing the bit depth. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I guess stitch and stack. Max is in a bad mood as a laundromat closing. <laughs> He's not. He's actually got a lot of good information tonight. <laughs> he says, yes, 24 megapixels yields 80 megapixels with a six photo stitch. Yeah. You know, I mean, you you showed us that day. You, with that house that you stitched together, it was like 180 megapixels once you cropped it to square it up. And it was a beautiful image. And you couldn't, you couldn't tell it wasn't shot with one exposure. You could not tell it. I couldn't. It looked good. 
<laughs> Max is on, back on Long Rider. He's talking. He's shutting him down. <laughs> Let's see. Hassan is going. Hassan, Hassan. I'm not sure which way I'm pronouncing it right. Is it one, Hassan, or two, Hassan? You have to let me know. But uh, he's going to the Georgia Aquarium, taking the, the kit lens and the 35 mil. Dude. If you own a DX camera, you should have a 35 mil. Yeah, camera. that 35. Okay, so it's Hassan. Thank you. Um, that 35 f1.8 is a beautiful lens. I used it on the D7000 for probably, I bought that lens, put it on that camera, and didn't remove it for like six or seven months. I just used that lens because I love the results it gave me. Beautiful lens. And they're, and they're, they cost nothing. In the, in the grand scheme of things, I think it has a metal flange it's, on it. It's the nifty 50 for DX lenses is what it is because of the- But it's, it's rendering is so clean. I just, it's a good lens. Yeah, it blew my mind how good it how good its rendering is. Yeah, that's a great lens. I would de that's the one I would be running when I went. I'd take that well, eighteen to fifty five as a backup. Well, if he's going inside, they you know hitting that you know getting out, being able to get that low in aperture, you know, yeah. two eight, get it that open, you can you know. That yeah, well, it's f one eight. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah, if you yeah, if sharp. you if you do the math on it, yeah. yeah. But that, yeah, that I mean, gives yeah, him a lot of light in that damn room. You're taking a thirty four hundred. Yeah. Doesn't it have a pop up on it? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thirty fours, the three thousands, the five thousands, and the seven thousands. Well, my eight ten's got a pop up flash. Yeah, I've taped the pop up flash down. Yeah, you can turn that off. Put it in program mode, and it won't it won't pop the flash. Metal flange and pop-up flash. Yeah, either program or aperture. I would run, I'd run one of them. Yeah, I've had problems with the 55, like if you turn it off, turn it back on. Oh yeah. Yeah, then they'll turn the flash Oh, it back don't on. have, a, it don't have a mode knob. I thought it had a mode knob to select if you, so you can put it in program mode and then it would just stay. Does it have a mode knob? He can tell us, he's yeah, got one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does, metal flange and pop-up flash. Oh, okay, he's talking about the, the lenses from earlier though yeah. that's not about this uh, yeah z95 i didn't even see that till just now sounds like a radio station yeah but welcome it's, to z95 yeah. the rock. <laughs> get your camera out <laughs> yes it has a mode knob there you go yeah yeah, yeah you, you can stick it in program mode and let it do all the thinking well, I, I, enjoy I, the day shooting and see or, i always ran it manual mode don't listen to that crap. <laughs> He's gonna be indoors, there ain't gonna be no light. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's gonna be terrible light in there. Run it in aperture priority yeah. and run that knob to 1.8 and just leave it there. <laughs> that way your exposure will be at least a little reasonable. <laughs> Take a tripod. If... <laughs> Take a tripod. <laughs> I bet they have a no tripod policy. <laughs> No, 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 I just started thinking about like, <laughs> what happens if you do long exposure of fish in an aquarium? It's going to be blurry lines because <laughs> they don't sit still. <laughs> they'll, they'll, a lot of times, though, they'll let the monopods in. Use it for like a walking stick. I've got one that's made by, ah, oh, it's the cheap brand, Sunpack or one of those companies. Um, I bought a cheap one. It's just a quill. It's like a collapsible leg off of a tripod, throw lever locks. And it's got the quarter quarter inch stud on the end. You can screw the camera on it. And a lot of times they'll let those in when they won't let tripods in. And if they won't let you use it, you can just stow it in your pack or whatever because it's just a little stick about this tall. You know, they're not very big. I keep one if I'm going somewhere in a venue where I suspect they won't let me bring a tripod because it will give you a lot more stability. You can lean against the wall and hold on to that thing, and you can get pretty darn stable with a monopod. Oh, C2 Disciple, C to C is saying, I was going to start a pot with Max and add the long rounds comment with suds and duds if Max brought his camera, but then Max is probably a, a Nikon shooter like me. <laughs> Max has a, a Siru carbon fiber monopod uh, worn out in nine months of intense use. See, Max is doing that. He's taking the monopod because it it will it'll get you into places where you can't take a tripod. And I have learned things 
okay. I'm gonna jump tracks. Monopod's a great thing in, in venues like that. We've been using tripods a lot over the last couple of days mm -hmm. since we're doing long exposures, getting blurry water and stuff. And we've learned a lot of things about tripods over the last two days that we didn't know. Like this Manfrotto be free. I've got my iPhone mounted on it right now for the video feed. <clears throat> One of the legs fell apart yesterday at the river and the tube slid up inside of the body. And it's rattling around in there. <clears throat> While I'm at the river trying to get a photo. <clears throat> so I gather it all up and I thought I'm done. So I start to look at it. I brought a Leatherman with me. It's in my pocket now, wherever it's at. Yeah. So I have this little Leatherman I keep with me all the time, you know. And I got, it's D-shaped tubing. So it'll only fit out of the little extension one way so it won't spin. So it's out of sync. So I start shaking it in circles and it walks it around till it lines up. And then I get it down into the opening a little bit by compressing the bipod leg until it bottomed out. So then I was able to barely reach up in there and get a hold of it and slide it out enough to get a hold of it again. So I got it out and got it put back together. But the tripod isn't very heavy duty. A B-Free isn't meant for that 70 to 200 you saw on that D810. That's too much camera for this tripod. It may be rated to hold a camera that heavy, but it ain't. It's, it's too light, it's too flimsy. The, camp, the, the, the tripod wants to flex a lot. When you stick that D810 and that 70 to 200 on it, it struggles to hold it up. Yeah. It's not a heavy duty tripod by any stretch of the word. It's meant for maybe a crop sensor camera or a smaller or a small camera and a lens for a small lens, you know, a prime, a small prime, not some kind of 400 millimeter F2.8 prime. You know, maybe a 135. Z series prime. Yeah, or or the new Z series lenses since they're plastic, yeah, they don't so weigh nothing. That was my joke. Yeah, you know, um, but seriously, it's not. If you're looking at the B Free as a travel tripod, just keep in mind that if you plan on using a full size DSLR and and long lenses, don't do it. Don't buy it. Because then the, this it's, is what happens when you use a big camera, heavy lenses, and a crappy small tripod yeah you get that and that that's a hundred and thirty dollar you know cpl with i think i paid another 30 bucks for the uh the brass uh, step down ring yeah this is all brass componentry this ain't the cheap aluminum ones like i buy this is the good stuff you know this is a b and w filter and you see it run and i was using a bigger tripod than the b free yeah yeah his was a, a heavy aluminum tripod and it still didn't lock off properly that, yeah it's a me photo it's i mean yeah. it's kind of good but that's the third time i've had leg issues with it like right that. so it's it would um i would recommend highly that if you can test drive tripods of your friends do it because i got the b free thinking it's carbon fiber it's man frodo it'll be good it's great, but it's not heavy duty enough for what I'm shooting with. A lot of times I would rather it be more rigid and I just shouldn't have got this tripod. It's, it's okay. And it's great for travel, but yeah. Well, see, I get to be free live, which is that tripod, but it's got the little micro video head on it. Uh huh. And it, it's, it's okay, but that's like for my J5 or my 5500, mm -hmm. I don't do anything else with it. Right, yeah, it's not heavy camera. Yeah, it's like yeah. none of my, my, my 800 series or 500 series will go on. Yeah. Maxim says he carries the carbon fiber monopod. He's wore it out in six months of heavy use because he can't take a tripod on the exercise walks in the city. Perfect example. To circle back around to that c2c disciples y'all talking about deals in small towns i picked up a manfrotto element that can make into a monopod for 10 bucks dude score <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> hassan says question what do you think the negativity has been so pointed at nikon for some youtubers yeah that's a good question i honestly think now i'm spitballing here I'm, I don't know for sure, because like I was saying in, in my last video, I'm pretty sure Nikon doesn't even know I exist, all right? So I have no clout with them whatsoever. I just use their gear, all right? I think it's because Nikon doesn't do the whole 
freebie crap to the YouTube community like you see Canon doing. Canon, Canon will throw cameras at YouTubers. Now, why do you think Peter McKinnon shoots Canon gear exclusively? Him and Canon Canada are pretty tight. You know, he used it to start with, but once they realized that he was gonna be a YouTube star, they started giving him crap, you know? You can see it in the videos. He basically admits it in a couple of them. But the, um, the Northrop's moved to, moved to Sony, and I'm pretty sure that that was done as a, you, you can kind of call it political, you can not call it political, whatever the right word is. You know, like Sony said, hey, if you'll use our cameras and not use Nikon cameras, then maybe maybe they didn't give them to them for free. We don't know because we're not in them circles. We're not sitting in those meetings. But, you know, like I said, I'm spitballing because you don't know. You're just speculating. I think that, they, that they're sponsoring them. I really do. You know, because why else would you change cameras to a completely different system and go through all that headache of liquidating all this gear and purchasing all this gear just to change brands because you think it's better a little bit you know he was he was all about canon 70 to 200 l lens i don't know if you remember that or not no. tony Northrop does headshots Really? And, I thought yeah. he just made mistakes on YouTube. He does now. Oh, okay. But before he got to that level, he was a headshot photographer. And he loved the Canon 7200L lens because the Nikon one, like mine, doesn't give near as much magnification racked out. He'd done comparisons where he mounted on the tripods, racked them out, and took the same photo. And the, the Nikon one is equivalent to really like 140 mil. It doesn't rack out near as far as the Canon lens does. And when the can, when the, the new Nikon lens, when they flipped the focus and zoom rings, that moved that helicoid mech out and yeah. it allowed them to get the magnification just like Canon. That's how they <laughs> fixed it. And if you notice, Canon lenses are already like that. Yeah. And that's how they were able to do it. He loved that L glass because of that. And that's why he got the 5DSR for the super high resolution headshot stuff. And He's, he was really good at headshots. I saw his photos. They're beautiful. He's good at it. But for him to switch counts like that, I mean, they had those huge Nikon lenses, you know, to shoot the birds in flight stuff with because they're big birders. And they had like the 600 mil F4s and all them huge glass, you know. And they sold all of it, moved to the Sony, and Sony didn't even have lenses? Come on. Something's going on there, you know. So it's just especially lately that Nikon is finally going full mirrorless like so many have been waiting for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's got a couple that are too light rigged up with the travel lids here for painting, easel for painting. Oh, you rigged them up as painting easels. That's a good idea. Turn a, turn a lightweight tripod into a painting easel so you can do um, oil painting. That'll work. We'll yeah, it's a, it'd be great for that. <laughs> that makes good sense. Dr. David, he'll make you an Erica Swiss mount that, turns, <laughs> that holds out into it. An L mount down that yeah. drops down into, a, into the cradle that holds yeah. the, the print. Yeah, I can do that. That's made out of metal. <laughs> yeah, it is. And you'd have to make an Erica Swiss blade. Now. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, see so here? Let me grab it. Hurt my foot. More up. Yeah, there's some of that. All right, guys. All of my YouTube videos for the last year have been made with this cinema quality video rig. <laughs> Has a light. That way my face is illuminated under my hat brim while I'm outside. That's the reason I added the light. Well, and I added the ND filter so that I could control my shutter speed and get cinematic motion blur in my fo in my video footage. That's why I have a little ND filter on my GoPro. And I have a good mic. But then I had to mount it to this little tripod. And I like this better than the little Gorilla Pod because I tried to be like Nacy Casey Neistat and run the Gorilla Pod, but the Gorilla Pods wear out too quick and they're just not all that great of a tripod. They're, they're actually kind of terrible. So... 
I bought the Manfrotto Pixie 2. It has adjustable legs and it's got a little ball head. It's, you know, it's, it's a nice little tripod. I immediately added an Arca Swiss bait base to it. Let me get this off of it here. I you know, just stuck it on the quarter 20 stud so that I have a Arca Swiss mount. And this allows me to, like when I travel, I'll take this video rig, I can walk this tripod through airport security and nobody cares. And it allows me to set a tripod up with my camera in places. I'll stick an Arca Swiss plate on my uh, Fuji X-T3 and I can just stick it on here and get a photo. It works pretty well for that. But then I made my own custom Arca Swiss mount for my GoPro so I could have an arm and I made a retaining nut to hold the light on. This machine me a, a big little um, thumb screw and run a quarter 20 bolt through it and lock tighted it in so I didn't have to try and machine the threads on it, but I just made, made it out of aluminum. Made me an extension bar so I could get the spacing on my light. And this allows me to loosen the light, spin it out of the way. Watch that, watch out, that, that gel will jump off. And then I can access this without having to remove this and I can just break it loose and turn it back to where I want it, lock it down and it's in place. Works really well, but I made my own Arca Swiss mount because I needed a custom one because they always want to put the hole in the center. So I was able to drill my hole off center and then drill and tap me a hole for my bar off to the side. <laughs> this worked out. Let's see what we got here. Let's stick this back together. <laughs> Hassan says, said, he says, I thought he just made YouTube's on mis mistakes on YouTube. Ouch. <laughs> Yeah, look what Blue Newt said. Switching systems. I'd rather move houses. Yeah, man. I would just soon take a beating as to trade systems. I mean, it would have to be something genuinely life-altering for me to switch camera systems at this point. <laughs> I, I really want to get the X-T3. I mean... But I'm so invested in an icon right now. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'm what doing I, with the X-T3 was... is unique. You know, I have one Fujinon lens. I have the kit lens and nothing else. I have. I, I looked at the 90 millimeter. I really like that 90 millimeter Fujinon lens. But for the price of that lens used, I can buy almost a dozen vintage lenses, vintage primes and zooms. I love playing with the vintage lenses on the X-T3. I just enjoy using them on it. So I just put it back on the shelf. Then I found that Nikkor 50 mil left one four for like a tenth of what that 90 mil was. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's personal preference, you know. But I like the manual controls of the, of the X-T3. I like how it simulates a film camera. It's just fun to use. I really enjoy shooting with that camera because it's fun to use. Oh, look, he called it an Olympus XT30. Well, just look at all the people that are switching from, from or for. I think you're meaning from the Fuji XT30, but Nikon is also doing APS-C mirrorless, but does not seem authentic to me. Nice. Yeah. What do you think about medium format film versus digital cameras like the D850? Ooh, that's a good question. I'll tell you. I watch Nick Carver on YouTube, and he shoots he shoots large format film. He'll shoot eight by ten film, I believe it is, on that big big box camera he's got. And there's no there's no replacement for the for that negative size. You know, he's shooting an eight by ten negative on some of them four by five negatives. The resolution in those negatives is insanity. He's printing some of them prints, you know, eighty and a hundred inches wide, and they look beautiful. They're sharp. It's hard to argue that. Did you ever see that documentary where the guy went out to the house and turned the house into a giant pinhole camera? No. Yeah, I'll have to dig up the link. I'll see if I can dig it up before the end of it. But they turned this old abandoned house into a giant pinhole camera, and they were doing silver plate. And the plate they had, they had guys, it was custom made. And it was like, I don't know, it was bigger than plot, a sheet of plywood. It was bigger than four Two guys. guys had to carry it? No, like four guys had to carry it. <laughs> I, I'll see if I can dig it up, but they turned an entire house into a pinhole camera, and they were using these ginormous 
Yeah. And pieces of glass to do silver plate. <laughs> it was and it was mind blowing. Yeah, you know? the resolution was just off the scale. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pinhole. And it was just a hole drilled into the side of a house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, I've got I've got a friend who does documentary photography and he uses an old Pentax medium format. Looks like a it's an SLR. It looks like a 35 millimeter, but it's bigger. It's a Pentax. He's actually got a couple of them. And that's his preferred cameras for doing his documentary work because he says the negatives give him so much resolution. Maybe the Fujifilm GFX 50 something and a couple of lenses. Wow. Yes, Nick. <laughs> Pentax 6x7. Yeah. The beautiful old Pentax cameras. He carries a couple of them. Now I'm gonna have to remember his name. He comes to the, my family does a singing style called Sacred Harp. It's a acapella, they classify it as folk music now, but it's basically church music from the late 1700s through to the 1900s and gospel music kind of replaced it. So there, it's a different kind of music. It's four part, it's sung with shaped notes instead of, um, Instead of the traditional, all of them are little round notes on regular music. So we can learn music without learning music. You learn what the four shapes mean. We only have four notes. You just, they just repeat. And it's real easy for the lay person to learn to read it that way. It works out really well. But it's a kind of a neat system. And he'd done a big documentary, uh, photo documentary on it. And they, they hung it in the Alabama State House as a photo exhibit for in the governor's mansion or the Alabama State House um, in the hall there. It was really neat to go see his work hanging in there. And I, I can't remember his name. Great documentary. He did, uh, uh, probably took him two years. It was at least a year, it might've been two years to do that documentary. It was a real neat thing. But he shot all of it on the Pentax 6x7s. Gorgeous photos, gorgeous photos. But the GFX cameras, they're, they're neat, and they're kind of niche cameras, niche, niche, however you want to say it. I mean, I kind of, I like, I like the idea of the 50 megapixel medium format sensor, bigger than 35 mil, whatever you want to call medium format, but, you know, it's not that big a deal to me. It doesn't gain me that much. When Max took the 6D, Canon 6D and made a 180 megapixel print with it, like he was saying, the gigapixel. Yeah. You know, you just start stitching together. You don't need those big sensor cameras with those huge files to edit in, in whatever your Lightroom style program is. You know, you can save yourself the horsepower necessary and just do the one stitch and edit it in Photoshop or whatever program you use to stitch it and just have to deal with the one file at the end that's a big file instead of every one of your files being a big file, you know? Because you don't always want everything to print billboard size. I don't. I want most of my prints to be typically eight by tens, you know? Prints that big. That's Good the, Lord, the guy standing beside it. That's the size of that's the, the plate. That's the negative. That, yeah. That's the negative is five feet tall. <laughs> I just linked it in chat. Okay. Yeah, but no, you scroll down all the way. Down. It's awesome. No, you you wrote the words, but you didn't put the link. Oh, I did. Or did you? I, I thought I did. It, look and see. Because it's not on here. I'm not seeing it. Oh, it's not here. You go. Yeah, look, yeah, look. Max says GFX camera is 33 by 44 millimeter, fake medium format. <laughs> Yeah, it's still a little tiny sensor. Still only 33 millimeters tall. You know, it's not like, it's not like it's this earth moving sides. It's 33 millimeters, guys. You know, it's, it's only that much, you know. <sighs> it does capture a lot of data and they do capture beautiful images, but you have to have lenses just for the GFX camera, you know, it uses a unique set of lenses. You can't use any aftermarket glass. Nobody makes lenses for it except Fujinon, if I'm right. Yeah. Nobody else makes GFX lenses. Um, I don't think. Somehow I think somebody made a lens for it. Hold on. One? 
Yeah. <laughs> no. I think it would be somebody like Zeiss or somebody that would. Oh, yeah. That. You know, it'd be a Zeiss Otis, cost $12,000. Well, <laughs> you could put it on a GFS 100. Yeah, another 10K. I mean, that's, that's jump change. Yeah, but, you know, the point being is, is that it it's, does it bring anything to the table? No, it really don't. Not after he. Once I saw that 180 megapixel sticks, I was like, I don't see the value in the bigger format sensors now. You know? You just need to pick one and start stitching images. If you want big files, stitch them. There's no value in it. There really ain't. Okay, it looks like somebody... <laughs> Derp, therefore I am. <laughs> what now? Looks like somebody adapted a Hasselblad HC150 onto a GFX. Oh. <laughs> so... Yeah, but phase one costs as much as, a, as building my house in 1980. <laughs> and you don't need it. Max showed however much an, a 6D cost. They're not that expensive. <laughs> he made an image bigger than the GFX 100 made and the Phase 1. Phase 1 only does, it's 100 megapixel, isn't it? I think it's a 100 megapixel sensor, ain't it? Or is it 50? Uh, I try not to look at the medium format stuff because that stuff is so far out of, you know. <laughs> when you don't need it. Manageable price range. I'm just like. Six, oh, stitch six images out of your D850 together and you've got a bigger image. You I told you, you know? about this. Okay, you remember me telling you about doing the moon stacks? Yeah. Yeah, so it winds up being like once you start doing like stacks of the moon. The resolution You increase. wind up having a gigapixel image of the moon. But instead of it all stitched around, it's all blended on top of each other to get the noise and the... And the, the resolution. Yeah, the resolution up. Yeah. And you get a super sharp image yeah. of the moon with a D850. You yeah. don't need a phase one. It's, it's a gimmick. It really is. At this point in the game, it's a gimmick. You don't need it. I'm convinced well, I of mean, it. You know, it just don't bring anything to the table. Yeah, yeah, okay, hold on, man. Well, I'll be devil's advocate at this. So, if you want to talk about your stack and how long it takes you to take all the shots and then import the shots and then process the shots to do it and then as a big giant image then process that versus going click process. But you won't. If you shoot the moon with a phase one, you're going to do an image stack with it too. Well, if I had the money to buy a phase one, then I would just, you know, put put the camera up onto an observatory that I bought too. But the point is, is that it's not it's not the perfect sensor. No. So it's not going to catch capture the moon in one shot either. You're going to image stack them just the same. If you if you're if you're that involved in getting the resolution <clears> like that, you're going to do an image stack regardless, no matter which sensor you use. Well. You know, at this point in the game... At that point in the game, you know... You I would, mean, for you reality... Using, you, yeah, in reality, you would be buying, like, that Canon, that, Canon, that new RA Canon, mm -hmm. and you would be, you know, mounting it on to... A telescope. A, an actual, tele, a, you know, telescope yeah. to do that. And then you would, you would still stitch images, because NASA stitches. Yeah. I mean, you know... So, yeah, I don't see the reason in, in buying the big sensor cameras. No more than, no more than people use large images. You know, large megapixel images. Because I, I'm printing twenty by thirty with stuff out of the D810, and it looks fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hang them in my living room. I'm happy with them. And <clears throat> I, I handheld shot the solar eclipse, and it's sharp, and it's printed twenty by thirty. I even cropped it some, I, and and it. The, the eclipse is this big, and it's it looks good. Well, the best one I did you know? was, I the best photo from the eclipse I was top. Took on an Icon 1J5. That's what you shot it with? Yeah, but then I had I had the F-mount adapter on it with the 70 to 300. Racked out. Right, yeah, the DX on there. So I had this little micro setup, and effectively, it turned that J5 with that 70 to 300 into a 600, mm -hmm. over 600 millimeter you know. Yeah. So I, I don't think I had the teleconverter with me that day. So I think was I was it? just it, 500 mil. Yeah. Because I had the two to 500 super zooms that racked out. Yeah. I don't think I had my teleconverter with me. Let me see what we got here. We got to catch up on our, our note, notes. Oh. Yeah. Debt free is the way to be. Yes. <laughs> Max agrees and I do too. 100 megapixel for a phase one. 
180. Uh -huh. Okay, so it is a 100 megapixel sensor. Okay. Yeah, stitching is the sensible choice. Yeah, I completely agree. After seeing you do it that day, there's there's no value in buying the big camera because you're not going to do that many large megapixel prints. You just ain't. Hassan says, what is your recommendation for a photo editing program for someone new to photography like myself? Well, not new. My first camera was a Nokia N65. You had a Nokia N65? Do you still have it? It's kind of collectible now. <laughs> yeah. But I stopped for years now, and now I'm back. I have been experimenting with non-Adobe products a lot lately because I'm sick of Adobe and their subscription-based right, operation. Of Adobe it, yeah. yeah, he's currently still using Lightroom and Photoshop. Yeah, he's, but I've, I've got everything else too, yeah. except for Capture One. Yeah, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Every every other program, and and I've went through Darktable and I've uh -huh. used GIMP, both of which will do okay. Um, both of which are shareware; they're free. They're literally free. You can download them and experiment with them and you've got zero lost money there. Just duplicate, save a copy of the file you edit so that you have a you don't destroy your original if it messes up your file and you just make you know just edit on photos, copies of photos. That way you don't worry about losing them while you play with it and learn it. I'm currently look using one called Luminar 3 and I prepaid for Luminar 4 after I used it some because I really like it. It's really, really easy to use and it's fast. I'm really, I'm really enjoying Luminar. All the stuff I've done this weekend, I've done on one called Raw Therapy because it's a raw editor and uh, it's freeware as well. Um, raw Therapy's kind of techy, but it's got, it, the, the version, the newest version that I have has um, like the basic adjustments it doesn't have a clarity slider like Lightroom has. Everybody loves that clarity and that dehaze slider. I, it doesn't have either one of those. You have to figure out how to get around that and do other things. But it's got a new thing called Retina X or Retin X or something like that. It's in like the fourth tab. And it acts a lot like the clarity slider. It looks a lot like clarity. So like I brought, I brought the leaves out a little bit in my landscape shots with that one and I pulled the amount or whatever the term was they use for how strong it is and just pulled the strength back on it so it didn't like look super hdr-ish but it's a good program raw therapy is okay it but it's it's kind of techy to learn but all of those work really reasonably well they really do and they're all freeware you don't have to buy them but that Luminar, it's got that AI, it's artificial intelligence detection, like it'll do sky enhancement and it'll do auto, it's it'll just kind of- It'll do sky replacement now. Yeah, it's, it's and, it, and it's really good at it. I just have problems with color and printing out of it. Omar Gonzalez, hello oh, David and friend. <laughs> this is Aaron. <laughs> hello. Hmm. The guy who produces, oh, wait a minute. What is your recommendation? I don't recommendation? anything except trouble. Oh, no. Uh, time saver is what C2C Disciple said. The guy who produces those huge photo installations of animals in the environment, what camera? I'm not sure I'm tracking. I'm not sure what you're meaning by that. Um, what uh, what huge installations? I'm I need a little more background. I'm not sure who that is. Oh yeah, Omar Omero Gonzalez is saying. Um, he's saying Jay Christina. I watched his photos about cutting the cord with Lightroom. I watched his video where he actually logged out of his Lightroom account, his Adobe account. Yeah. It took him literally five minutes of clicking, no, I don't want to stay in well, they, pages well, to keep you from leaving it. It exposed like seven and a half, I can't remember how much was it, 700,000 or seven and a half million um, accounts information? Not yeah. the passwords, just their account information. Yeah, but still, yeah. And yeah, we were talking about this the other night. It's mm -hmm. like Adobe... Like, you know, they produce Flash and mm -hmm. Acrobat, and those are extremely vol volatile 
very very vulnerable programs. Yeah, they're big they're big security holes in your system now. Yeah. Guys. Yeah, he's a software engineer in the daytime and he's a super photographer at night. I art geek. <laughs> Very comprehensive and well done and thought out. Yeah. Yeah, I liked his videos. I watched Jay Christina. It's kind of neat to see what kind of tea he brings. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, um, I really enjoy it. Yeah, those series will tell you things. But now he's approaching it strictly from a professional standpoint and a professional migrating from Lightroom to the new program. Remember that when you watch his video. He's not doing it from a hobbyist moving, you know, trying to get a program to learn how to edit. He's trying to do a workflow for a professional that's efficient. Just keep that in mind. He's, he's doing it as a business tool. Yeah, so yeah. When, he, when he gives you his opinion on them, it's based on how much work it is for him to work with the program and how hard it is for him to use it to earn money. He's doing that with it. So just keep that in mind, you know, because the freeware is typically never as user friendly as Lightroom is. Lightroom is very user friendly. That's the beauty of Lightroom. Until it slows down. Or it crashes. Yeah. But until it crashes, it's an excellent piece of software. I mean, I love Lightroom. I'll just tell you the truth. I just don't like the company's administrative techniques. If if you could buy Lightroom and just leave it on your computer and not have to argue with that whole subscription thing, I would use it because it's good program. It really is. But I just don't, I just can't go along with that subscription-based theory, theory anymore. I just can't deal with it. Not when there's free alternatives that work pretty much exactly the same. You know, once you learn how to use them. Yeah. You know, you just got to learn how to use them. That's the key is the deal with the learning curve. Yeah. Omero says, there are very good options out there <coughs> for free and reasonably priced. Yeah. yeah. Like Affinity, I said, though, Affinity I bought the photo. photo. Hmm? I, I, I can't swear enough by Affinity Photo. That's like... Affinity? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been gaining so much steam, and it's like... Well, it's because Lightroom's being well, dirtbags. Well, it's, <laughs> Affinity's more of a Photoshop replacement mm -hmm. that falls in the same spectrum as like Photoshop and GIMP mm -hmm. as a image manipulation program like GIMP was the GNU image mm -hmm. manipulation program. That's how it got called. Yeah. Away from the Yeah, license. graphic image manipulation program, yeah. GIMP. Yeah. But now, they finally built in the raw editor functionality, so you can now open yeah, it's, it's the got raw it. files directly in GIMP. Used to, you had to have a raw converter to yeah. be able to edit in it. But now, you can do, and they've got it cleaned up a lot to where you can do the, the adjustments and are really easy to do now. they yeah. got a whole tab just for photo adjustments. and it's Now, if you're in the Linux realm, Darktable and GIMP is the way to go. Yeah. I like Darktable. I've yeah. got it on here. It's right. No, that's, that's uh, DaVinci Resolve. You can edit photos in DaVinci Resolve. I've done it. <laughs> in the edit tab. You have to drag them into the timeline. Weren't you using something else last year when I was playing around with DaVinci? Yeah. I, yeah. Was, um, I was using iMovie by Apple. Okay. Yeah. I used iMovie and then I moved to DaVinci because I wanted more than two video clips on the timeline at once to be able to stack more than just two clips. Yeah. And iMovie won't let you go over two. Yeah. And I wanted to be able to put like graphics stacked above that or multiple layers. Like if you want letters to pop up in sequence, you want the first letter to start and then the second letter to start and then yeah. the third letter. Well, you couldn't go over two letters. You couldn't go over one. You had to build it in a separate piece of software, export it and bring that in. And it was just a bunch of headache. And da Vinci is pretty amazing for what it is too. And for free. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't believe how good Resolve works. I should have to write up our article on like some stuff on, on photography software. Hmm? I should write up an article on photography software. Yeah. I said point, point, you know, people like in the direction of pros and cons of mm -hmm. pain and cost. Yeah. What, what are your needs versus yeah. what are your, what are your, you Yeah. Know. Usually when somebody says, Hey, I, I need something. What do you recommend? And I'm like, well, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, that matters. Yeah, now like somebody says, "Hey, I need a new camera." I'm like, "Well, what are you what gonna photograph?" Of, yeah, what, what? What's the what's the yeah. what's the requirements? Yeah, yeah. 
So I mean, if you're if you're a casual photographer, I, I don't think it's worth the money to invest in Adobe. At all? No, no at all. Not even in the ten dollar a month part. Twenty dollars. Yeah. They went up, I think, to twenty. But it I'm ain't worth it. Still at ten. Is it? I'm grandfathered in. But it's still that's one hundred twenty dollars a year. Yeah, but what, I mean, what kind of software could you buy for one hundred twenty dollars? A lot. Yeah, you know, and then you own it. You bought it once. Yeah. You know, after one year, you don't have to buy it again. You don't have to, but you sometimes know, they trick you into it. I mean, uh, you know, every so often you're going to upgrade your software. I've been, I've been. People do it. it. Everybody I've been does. Doing it, like, because I have on one. Well, on one, I've been doing every year. Uh, like Alien Skin Exposure. Uh huh. That's a good program too. If you've never played, I like. That's like one of my favorite programs for doing portraiture work in. It, mm -hmm. But I, I upgrade it every two years. Yeah. That's about my time table, is at least two years. Yeah. Is, uh, Not unless they have like some new feature that well, comes like, out. Right now, I'm on Resolve 15. I haven't upgraded to the 16 yet because I finally learned where the, all the stuff <clears> in 15 was. Yeah. And I know as soon as I upgrade, they're going to move the buttons. Nah. <laughs> I just don't want to have to learn where the new buttons are. I don't. And the features they're adding are typically in Fusion, which is their special effects editor, and I don't use the Fusion hardly at all. I don't I don't need it right now. Hey, I played around with it, it was a little weird. It's yeah, that whole node base construction is it's very techy. And once you understand it, and I've watched several videos on how to build it, it's a lot it's really involved. And it takes a lot of time to build those nodes in to create that little device, to do that one little six second thing. And it just the the payoff versus the work isn't there for me. That's why I don't use the Fusion tab. Plus, it slows my computer way down when you turn the Fusion devices on. They've got some pre-built Fusion devices, like when it, my my intro. It's the light clicks and it's the the neon lamp Georgia photographer. That Georgia photographer neon lamp is a fusion clip and you just put your text in it and, yeah. it, and it builds that compiled yeah. yeah so i exported it as a as a video clip and turned and turned it into an mpeg4 or whatever it is that it exports as and then brought that back in and it brought the speed of the system way up because it's not a fusion clip anymore yeah then i just added my soundtrack to it because it doesn't get it doesn't have sound that 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 buzzing neon lamp sound is built from Electronic static, a jigsaw, um, the pull chain sound I added to the ends later. It didn't have it to start with. I added it so it could go black on both ends and turn it on and off. And then there's another oddball sound that I used. And by combining those three or four, it sounds like a, a neon lamp. <laughs> no, I was playing with Foley. I did a bunch of Foley video searching on that to learn how to do it. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to catch up on the, the comments here. Um, I'm assuming it's, uh, it says Omero. I think the H is silent. Give me, a, give me a thumbs up or a one or something that tell me if I'm saying your name right because I don't want to sit here and, and say your name wrong like 53 times. Is it Omero or Homero? It's Omero, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Omero, thank you. Um, silent H. Cool. Yeah, I hate to butcher names. It bugs me. He says, David, what do you use to edit your videos? And I use DaVinci Resolve. We 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 got past that. We got grandfathered in on the subscription. Nice. <laughs> Hassan, great free software for editing. It's been available for many years. Maybe not as fully featured as certain Adobe products, but 95% of the people don't use the programs that are full potential. There's whole sections of Resolve I don't even touch. And there's whole sections of GIMP that I don't even know what they do. And I can, I can do my, I can edit my entire photos in GIMP and they look beautiful without, um, Without even knowing what some of this stuff does. I mean, there's some complicated crap in GIMP. They, there's some very smart people wrote that program. <laughs> Let's see here. It says, they did raise three bucks on us on, a while back. Oh, he's talking about Adobe, I think. In other words, I'm saying simple editing programs are adequate for the majority. And they are. You're right. Omero's right. Um, once you learn GIMP, I use it to make my thumbnails. And I'll do some... 
I'll play around and do some stuff with it. Like I make PNGs so that there's a clear background when I want to drop one in a video. I'll do that with it. And I'll do some photo editing. Like I, I edited one of my photos from today in GIMP where I wanted to do some dodging and burning. You can do it in GIMP real easy. I like it. In other words, I'm saying that simple editing, yeah. But yeah, currently at home, I'm doing Luminar. And once I get my code, you can download Luminar to multiple computers, but you have to have your account set up. And I screwed up and I bought it and didn't save either the login credentials or I didn't get my login credentials when I bought it because I just downloaded it and paid for it. And that was my mistake. So until I sent them the copy of the receipt where I paid for it with PayPal, and they said once I sent once they approve that that they they'll give me the code or give me the account or whatever it is so I can put it on my, my, my notebook computer too. But I like I like Luminar. Now it, it has crashed with me some, so I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I'm kind of curious if Luminar Four is going to crash like Three does. But what's beautiful about three is when it does crash, it doesn't lose my edits. See, it loses mine though. Really? Yeah, I've lost like hours upon hours of work on it. Bizarre, cause I'll open mine back up and it's exactly like it was when it went down. I don't know what the difference is. Yeah, I mean, when it works and mm -hmm. it's good, you know, but I'm having like color grade issues too. Yeah. Now, I think there's like a problem, like I was telling you last night, there's something wrong with the way it's compiled. Yeah, because what because you're saying that what it's exporting is what's not what you're seeing on the screen. No, it does. I, I, yeah, you look at it; it's completely different. Interesting. Yeah. See, I haven't printed well, anything out of I, it yet. If I import it, but I, I still think there's something going on with like you know the AMD architecture. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's AMD friendly. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Cause see, I have an Intel processor in my machine. Even, even my video card's AMD. Yeah. So. I don't even remember who makes my video card. Probably NVIDIA or Intel. I think it's NVIDIA. Yeah. But it's an Intel processor because it was bought as a package machine. Yeah. And it and they were bragging about Intel inside, of course. It has the sticker, you know. But, uh, yeah, it, it works good, but it wants to crash fairly. Re um, but you don't have S you, you run uh, SSDs? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because that new... That new image library database thing should be running on an SSD. I can't recommend that program on, on a mechanical hard drive. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because that database, that database requires a lot of rewrite access. Yeah. I -op, so yeah, you need to make sure that's running on a SSD. Interesting. Yep. Huh. Almost the same thing with, uh, with uh, Lightroom too, Lightroom cache and database. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty intensive when it gets going. Yeah. He's got to go outside and cure his nicotine level. It's getting low. Make sure the creek's still running. Uh-huh. He says, um, Omero said, what, what do you recommend for iPad? I recommend you take your iPad and you power it down. You take a photo of it with your iPhone and you put it on eBay and sell it. <laughs> I don't like iPads. It's just, I just don't enjoy using them. I know. I've never enjoyed using an iPad. I just, I don't know why. I have an iPhone X and I have a MacBook Pro. Man, I, and I like them really well, but I just don't care for iPads. I never have. And I messed with the iPad Pro a little bit and it was okay, but I just can't get into it. I don't know why. I just don't enjoy using iPads. So I don't honestly know. Um, I don't know what you can get on an iPad to do editing with, but I know um, Rodney uh, Bass Angler. If he was here, he uses an iPad to edit, and he he likes it. He would tell you what it was. Hey, uh, Axe, are you still in here? I'm not sure who all's still in the in in the um, what do you call it? You suffer from iPad phobia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just never have cared for them. My wife and my, my little girl, they they both love it. They've got the iPad mini, the little half size one. They love that one. We've got we've got a big iPad too. We never use it. It sits on the shelf. It's dead. It's probably run down. Um, 
but they got we got a deal on that little one somewhere, and they love that little iPad. And it's like well, whatever. They don't have a back button. <laughs> Yeah, it's multi-finger swap or something to go back. I don't know. <laughs> what version of raw therapy? You was asking me. Let me see. It's right here. I'll have to open it and see. I use my phone. Forget about tablets. That's what I do. I do all of the stuff I would have used my iPad for on my phone. All right. Let's go up here. Well, Raw Therapy version 5.4 is the one that's on this computer. I'm not sure what the most recent is. This one runs good on my Mac, so I'm using it. Until it starts giving me crashing issues, I won't change it. Because um, I just upgraded the iOS on the Mac to Mojave. Not long ago, maybe six months ago, I upgraded to Mojave on it. This is a 2015 MacBook Pro, mid-2015 it says. But it was pretty well loaded in 2015, so it still runs good. It doesn't give me much trouble. It, it struggles to run DaVinci. Resolve is kind of hard on it. Um, I normally reduce the resolution of the rendering and the, and the proxy deal. I run all that at like 25% with it. And it'll, it'll pretty well keep up, but the desktop machine at home can handle Resolve just fine. So I relegate this one to just traveling. I don't use it at home hardly at all anymore. That's why it's got raw therapy on it and it don't have Luminar on it. I tried to put it on it before I left and I couldn't, so I'm having to struggle around with raw therapy <laughs> while I'm here. But yeah, I don't upgrade raw therapy until it starts crashing. It'll start, there'll be a point when I upgrade the OS in the computer and raw therapy won't jive with it and i'll have to but until then i just use it like it is it's a Mac problem. yeah Mac's been horrible with that. Mm -hmm. they changed the architecture of the os and the new os doesn't cohabitate with the older yeah, programs yeah i read that all the time it's like it's a, it's a it's a it's no it's not compatible with this yeah it, it's not backwards compatible all right i got a new item i bought something by think tank photo it's very expensive because <laughs> it's got their little logo on it. That makes it expensive. <laughs> Omar's asked me, have you done film photography lately? I've done half of film photography lately. I've shot some photos, and I have the little canisters of film, but I haven't developed any of them. Grant's helping me sort that out. He's got a guy that does developing, and I'm probably going to box mine up and send them to him. I've got them all shot. Um, rated at half the ISO of the film on the box like Max said to do. So I've got to send the note with them to develop them per his instructions. I wrote all that down. But I haven't been shooting film mainly because, just, I'm just going to tell you the truth, it's a hassle. Uh, I, I enjoy the film experience, but the processing afterwards is still, a, it's, it's a hassle enough that I would just just as soon do it with my X-T3 for just general photography. I mean, it's kind of fun to have a film film camera. People ask you, can I see the picture? And you show them the back and it's got the little tab tore off the film box so they can see the ISO and all the brand of film. And it's like, nope, <laughs> it'll be a few weeks. <laughs> and in my case, apparently it's gonna be a few months. <laughs> but no, I haven't shot any film photography haven't done enough that I've developed them. And I probably should send off what I've done because I'm starting to accumulate exposed film. And I haven't, I'm forgetting what's on the film. I haven't like documented it. I haven't wrote it down in a log book or anything like I should have. But I'm trying to reduce my, my street photography kit to jump back over to this. Max says, iPad is a giant phone that does not make phone calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is a solution to a problem I've been having with my street photography. I wear my little backpack around while I shoot street because I want to carry a few items and uh, 
but I don't use most of what's in the pack, but I don't want to break down the pack just to walk around and then recompile it later. So what I bought is this is a little lens dump bag by Think Tank. They, they had them on sale the other day. And what is it, C2C Disciples? I, think, I keep telling myself I'm getting the lens pouches and ditching the bag or backpack when shooting events and weddings. Yeah, they got all different sizes. This one's, I think, it's some kind of prime lens bag. It's small, as you can see. But the lenses I'm using, you know, this is a 50 millimeter F1 forward. It fits down all the way. I could sit, literally, I could put this 20 mil on top of it, you know. There's room. And then if I cinch this down, they wouldn't fall out. But um, this, what this will allow me to do is it's got a, a few little compartments too. So I can stick a battery or some memory cards. It's got a little, a little, separable pocket on the inside here if you can stick some items in he uh told me the other day he's actually going to help me get some business cards up that'll have my website on them that way we can because people keep asking me do you have a website do you have a card still don't handle cards <laughs> i'm pathetic but but yeah it's got just enough widgets that you can put stuff on it that you would need like memory cards or the second lens, because I, I carry primes, so I like to have two focal lens. One wide one and normally one mid to telephoto. And that way I can just carry this and leave the pack in the truck. And I'm really looking forward to trying this out when I get back home. I ain't used it here because we just drive the truck or the car, we took his Subaru or my truck, whatever, wherever we go. And we use it like a giant camera bag. We'll leave the bags open in the back seat of the truck and just leave the doors open. We'll get out like some kind of SWAT event and go out and start taking photos and we'll go over and open up the truck, change lenses or whatever, and then go back and take more photos. <laughs> it's just like a giant camera bag. It works out really well. <clears throat> yeah, for the exception of today, we haven't had to pack much yeah. in our bags. Yeah. And today we walked up to that waterfall, so we took our packs with all our camera gear in them all the way up. Not ourselves. all our camera gear. No, no. 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 <laughs> That's true. I took my Fuji kit, my Think Tank backpack. We exercised our bags. <laughs> yeah. That's true, because I've got three bags of crap. I got the roller case and two camera bags, and then the computer bag is, I don't yeah. count it. I took two out of four lenses with me. Yeah. Yeah, I left the big ones. It was a 15, a 30, and a 7200 stayed in this truck. Blue Newt's giving up on us. He's going to bed. Good night, Good night. dude. Thank you for coming in as long as you did, dude. You, I really appreciate it. I really do. It's been fun. That's it. See to see disciples says, I keep telling myself that I'm getting the lens pouches and ditching the bag or backpack and shooting events and weddings with the wives. Yeah. Dude, I can see. You get the bigger ones that would hold the heavy hitter lenses where you can just throw them in them. Honestly, I would run two cameras. If I was shooting a wedding, I'd have one yeah. with a 24 to 70 and one with a 70 to 200. And I'd run that dual camera strap setup where it hangs onto each side, or I'd run two of them. What's that brand? Um, not Scorpion. Um, it makes the little metal stud hangers that hangs your camera on it. I can't remember the brand name of it now. Do y'all remember? You're talking about the one that clips on your, like, your, your chest? They got one that goes on your, your yeah. backpack strap too, but they got belt pouch deals with them as well. Yeah. And it's and literally, you, you put the hand strap on your camera, you just stick it on that little holster, spider holster. Oh, no. I think I, it's spider I, I, I've brand. I've seen one that's a holster. Google, Google search spider camera holster. Muffy. I think that's it. I got these We have the internet available to okay. us here. We have the technology. Yeah, we do have that tech. Used Photo Pro had a bunch of used ones for sale a couple weeks ago. Oh, dude, you should have grabbed them. Yeah, C2C Disciple says it's Spider. Spider, yeah, Spider Camera Holster. Yeah, that's it. Is this the one I'm thinking of? Yeah, they've got the they've got the shoulder mount too, but it's a it's a quick lock stud deal. Pick the Spider Light. The Pro is the same thing. It's just the Spider Lights for like mirrorless and Spider Pros for DSLRs. Yeah, this isn't this isn't what I was thinking about. There's like a a lens holster that rotates. Yeah. But you put like, you, and it, it, it's got the flange mount on there, so mm -hmm. it just, and then when you- Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, it's got a bayonet latch. 
Yeah, and use latcher lens to it so it can't fall off. Yeah, that spider deal is cool because it's got a lock on that quick, and it's literally, you just drop it in, click, and it's in there. Because I got a friend who came up from Florida and he had them for his X-T3 and his, um, I think he had the, maybe the X-Pro2 or the X-T30. He had a couple of the, the Fuji cameras and he was running them spider lights. He really liked them. Because it eliminates the camera strap, but yeah. Yeah, Did you get the big it. honking belt or just use a regular? I'm just gonna put it on my belt. I just got this. That's my plan. And I'm because see it it unvelcros at the bottom, and you just literally stick your stick it through on your belt loop. I'm just gonna do that with it. Just use it on mine like that. Yeah. I'm not real sure what that hard plastic thing is. I guess it's so it don't flex. But yeah, I just plan on sticking it on my belt and just running it out of the way on the back side. That way I can just throw a lens in it. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to using that next week. That'll be next week. I'll be shooting some street with it next week in Chattanooga. As he said, I thought Peak Design did the dual lens. Oh, they do. But the Peak Design ones, this is the deal that, that Fook was telling me, was that the spider ones allow the camera to move. All right, it's just a ball stud on the bottom of an Arca Swiss plate, basically, that screws onto the camera is what you got. And it comes off of the corner at a slight angle so the camera hangs naturally out of the way. So you just latch it in and it can orbit in there. It's a little, it's like a little ball head on the end of it. And the camera can turn and move with your body. Like if you, if you move, it can move with you with where the Peak Design ones latch on to a lock plate. Well, it's the one like on the grip. <clears throat> So it locks on and it's rigid mounted and it can't move and pivot with the body. So it, you're, you're kind of pinned in place with it. He said the belt ones are the same way. They don't, they don't flex and move with your body. So if you move it around to the front at all where you could get to it easily, it binds, you can't bend over. It won't move out of the way. So he, that's why he didn't like the peak design one. He said he tried them and he likes the spider ones way better because of that. <clears throat> I haven't bought the spider one yet. I thought about actually making it. Because <laughs> I looked at how it's made. You have the technology. Yeah, I bought the belt clips. <laughs> I already have them in the shop. I just ain't made one yet. Oh, look. <coughs> Omero's gone. Good night, guys. Gotta go. Thank you for the unbiased, never hating anything or any brand reviews. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of bias in here tonight. There's a, there's a lot of love for Nikon in this room. I'll be honest with you. There, on this table is Think Tank Photo, one Tamron lens hood, one Canon, um, well, your, your CPL is over there, yeah, but we, the rest of it is Nikon. <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we want you to just get your gear out and go take some pictures with it. That's the best thing to do. Go yeah. out. Go out and make photos. Go out. Here, here's one of the greatest mm -hmm. things I can tell everybody to do is go out, take one picture a day. <laughs> He's got a problem with these. I don't. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. The problem is, is the box still has Jesus in it. It's bottomless. <laughs> yeah, now I, I tell everybody, go out, take a picture a day. Even if it's mm -hmm. with your, 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 your cell phone. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you know, if you think there's going to be like a halfway decent sunset, go out and take a picture of it just because you get to watch a pretty sunset mm -hmm. and you get that exercise of going to go out and take a picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good philosophy. Or, or, you know, get up in the morning, go for a walk and take a picture of a sunrise or something mm -hmm. on the, during the walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you guys are having too much fun. All right. <laughs> Good night, Omar. Omero, excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Good night. Yeah. We've had a good weekend. I think we're going to log off of here. Maybe relax a little bit. What's that? <laughs> That's what you do after you hike four miles up and out of a mountain and down the other side of it, apparently, <laughs> with bad knees and, and ankles. <laughs> Old men climbing mountains. Yeah, everybody's bailing anyway. We've already been on here over two hours. That's a good one. Yeah. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with us like you have. You got any questions? 
before we before we shut this down, has anybody got questions that that we haven't addressed tonight? Because we've we've went over a myriad of subject matters. If you want the right answer, it'll cost double. Uh huh. Which is also still free. <laughs> See to see disciples going. Enjoy the discussion. Oh, and thank and thanks for the links, Aaron. I believe what he no, no said. Problem. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> or he enjoyed the links. Yeah, one of the two. I'm glad you. I'm glad you guys got to be a part of this. <coughs> yeah, I need to get you hooked up with some more software. Uh -huh. It'd be cool, to, you know, because then we could like pull in people with, like Skype. Mm -hmm. We could actually do this remotely with like you know two or three people. Mm-hmm. Have like a round table one evening. Cool. Yeah. We'll do that. Because we're spread all across the globe. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're going to sign off, guys. I appreciate you joining me. This is David, the Georgia photographer. And my philosophy has been and still is, get your camera out and go take a picture with it. All right? We'll see you all later. Bye-bye. If I can get this thing to stop.